year's theme on innovating governance for the new normal, the DPRM is focusing on the theme Reset and Rebuild for a better Philippines in the post-pandemic world. Through this theme, we wish to emphasize that to rebuild from the COVID-19 pandemic and create a better Philippines, we need to reset our paradigms and practices by balancing the interests of people, profit, and planet. This means placing equal importance on economic, social, and environmental well-being and sustainability. To make this possible, the government should set the right policies that will allow all citizens, regardless of status in life, to access essential public services and will protect all segments of the population, especially the poor and the vulnerable, from various risks through effective social protection systems. The business sector, for its part, should explore ways and areas where it can be both profitable and socially responsible. Business owners and operators should embrace decent work principles, provide the best service to their customers, and care for the well-being of their employees, the community, and the environment. Meanwhile, the civil society should continue reaching out to sectors that do not have access to government channels. It should also strengthen its advocacy for more accountable and responsive governance and more sustainable business practices. The academe also has an important role to play. It should ensure that the new modes of delivering education and training under the new normal are accessible to all and will not widen economic and social inequalities. As individual citizens, we also need to start living more responsibly by adopting more sustainable lifestyles. We should start the reset and rebuild agenda with ourselves to effectively influence others. Collectively, we all need to work together. The government, business sector, academe, civil society, and the general public should join forces in pursuing a shared vision of an equitable, sustainable, and resilient post-pandemic Philippines. Know more about the DPRM and how you can participate by visiting its website. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication, and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies, o PIDS, na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiya ang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ng kalagahan ng polisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. 
Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan.
dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiya ang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ng kalaghan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag polisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! Policies can either make or break a country and its people. Hence, they should be thoroughly studied and evaluated. This is where policy research comes in. Through Malacanang Proclamation 247 in 2002, the government declared the month of September as Development Policy Research Month or DPRM. The DPRM aims to promote nationwide awareness on the importance of policy research in the formulation of evidence-based policies, plans, and programs. It also aims to cultivate a strong culture of research and research use among decision makers and raise the public's literacy on socio-economic issues. The proclamation also designated the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS to oversee and coordinate all activities related to the DPRM. Various activities such as policy forums, press conferences, social media promotion, and the annual public policy conference are organized by PIDS and its partners to celebrate the DPRM. Every year, the DPRM focuses on a particular theme which is usually a current or an emerging development issue of national significance. For instance, the DPRM has centered on issues pertaining to regulations, risk reduction and management, decentralization, the fourth industrial revolution, the new globalization, and the reforms needed to address the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. This 2021, to follow through on last year's theme on innovating governance for the new normal, the DPRM is focusing on the theme Reset and Rebuild for a Better Philippines in the Post-Pandemic World. Through this theme, we wish to emphasize that to rebuild from the COVID-19 pandemic and create a better Philippines, we need to reset our paradigms and practices by balancing the interests of people, profit, and planet. This means placing equal importance on economic, social, and environmental well-being and sustainability. To make this possible, the government should set the right policies that will allow all citizens, regardless of status in life, to access essential public services and will protect all segments of the population, especially the poor and the vulnerable, from various risks through effective social protection systems. The business sector, for its part, should explore ways and areas where it can be both profitable and socially responsible. Business owners and operators should embrace decent work principles, provide the best service to their customers, and care for the well-being of their employees, the community, and the environment. Meanwhile, the civil society should continue reaching out to sectors that do not have access to government channels. It should also strengthen its advocacy for more accountable and responsive governance and more sustainable business practices. The academe also has an important role to play. It should ensure that the new modes of delivering education and training under the new normal are accessible to all and will not widen economic and social inequalities. As individual citizens, we also need to start living more responsibly by adopting more sustainable lifestyles. 
We should start the reset and rebuild agenda with ourselves to effectively influence others. Collectively, we all need to work together. The government, business sector, academe, civil society, and the general public should join forces in pursuing a shared vision of an equitable, sustainable, and resilient post-pandemic Philippines. Know more about the DPRM and how you can participate by visiting its website.
Hi, I'm Manny Pinol. Welcome to my Mindanao. This is my birthplace, my hometown. I love this place. Not so much is known of this beautiful island. All they hear about are bombings, killings, the fighting, the conflict. There's more to Mindanao than just that. For example, did you know that Mindanao has one-third of the total land area of the country at 9.7 million hectares? It has a population of 25 million people. There are six regions in Mindanao. Regions 9, which is Ambuanga. Region 10, Northern Mindanao. Region 11, which is Davao region. Region 12, Central Mindanao. Region 13, Caraga region. And the Bangsamoro Autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao. There are 27 provinces. 422 municipalities, 33 cities, and 10,084 barangays. This is Mindanao, but not much is known about Mindanao. Did you know that Mindanao's economic growth is higher than the Philippine national growth at 7.2? It is contributing 54% of the country's food supply, and it could supply more if given the opportunity to do so with additional infrastructure. So today, let me bring you to places unexplored in Mindanao as I present to you the other face of my Mindanao, the beauty and bounty of the island of Mindanao. This week, I will bring you to the town of Alamada in my home province, North Cotabato. This town was named after a fierce Iranun warrior, Dato Amay Bulyok Alamada. This is an agricultural town producing corn, rice. But there is more to this town than just the name. President Ramon Magsaysay signed an executive order designating this town as a resettlement area for former members of the Hukbalahap. Hukbung Bayan Laban sa Hapon. So, in this town, there are Ilocanos, there are Kapampangans, there are Iranuns, of course, and indigenous people. But there is more to Alamada than just being an agricultural town. We are going to discover a wonder of nature in this trip to Alamada today. It is called Asik Asik Falls or the sprinkling falls. Come, let's discover the beauty of Alamada. It was in 1969 when the municipality of Alamada was created. It is now a first-class town with 17 barangays and a population of 70,000. Among its major agricultural products are upland rice, corn, banana, coconut, palm oil, and rubber. Known as the source of water, which flows down to the towns of Libungan and Midsayap through the Alamada-Libungan River, Alamada was just a quiet agricultural town until 2011, when a unique waterfalls was discovered in situ Dulao, Upper Dado. It is a waterfall like no other because there is no river from where the water would fall from. The water actually gushes out of the side of a cliff about 60 meters high and sprinkles down on the river which flows from Lake Baranibod in the boundary of the town with Bodon Maguindanao. The falls was later called Asik Asik, which literally means sprinkling water. While I served as governor of North Cotabato for nine years, from 1998 to 2007, I never knew of the existence of this wonder of nature. Along with the mayor of the town now, Jesus Sagdalan, who served as my vice governor, 
I went to as far as Dadai Falls upstream in the 2000s. But we never knew that there was this magical wonder of nature in the same area because it was thickly forested at the time. The discovery of Asik-Asik Falls came after a strong typhoon, one of the very few that sit Mindanao, felled many trees in the area in the year 2008, followed by a forest fire which cleared the area of vegetation. Following its discovery in 2011, a local tourist, Ivy Joy Urbano, uploaded the first set of photos of Asik Asik on Facebook in April 2012. The news spread like wildfire. Soon, videos and photos of Asik Asik Falls were featured on TV and splashed in the front pages of natural resources. Is moving to have this wonder of nature declared as a geological monument. Personally, I have not heard of or seen photos of similar waterfalls. There is only one in Shasta, California, the Burney Falls, where water also gushes out of the side of a cliff. But there is a river right in the middle with a main waterfall. Asik Asik is a virtual underground river whose source is not known yet. The nearest body of water is Lake Baranibod, which is about 6.5 miles upstream. While it has been seven years since Asik Asik Falls came to the public consciousness, it is still difficult to go to the area. Selamat Pangulung Duterte, Sekretari Pinyol, Sekretari Jan Jones Nandar, dan itu pun juga itu, Alamada, komposisi almost 80,000 hektars, ay isang settlement area. Kami po ay anda sa settlement Nandar. So, kami po yung tutulungan at salamat kay Sekretari Simato sa pagbibigay niya ng mga forest rangers na nangangalaga ngayon na ang aming kalikasan, ang aming kagubatan ay mapangalagaan. The town has already prepared a master plan for the protection and conservation of Asik Asik Falls and this will be presented to the Mindanao Development Authority next month in the presence of Minda's partner agencies. It is our hope that Asik Asik will be properly protected through a sustainable agroforestry program to ensure that the next generation of Filipinos could see for themselves the beauty of Mindanao and the blessings God has showered on this land.
This week, I bring you to the beautiful, idyllic, scenic, rustic, and historic city of Dapitan in Sambuanga del Norte. Historic sapagkat uh, of all places in Mindanao, ito lang po yung lugar na ang pangalan ay nakaukit sa kasaysayan ng ating uh, national hero na si Dr. Jose Rizal. Because Dr. Jose Rizal spent four years of his life here in this area. Right in front of me is the Rizal Shrine. Dito po siya itinapon ng mga Espanyol ng apat na taon at dito siya nagpractice ng medicine. Dito niya rin nakilala ang isang magandang dilag na ang pangalan ay Josephine Bracken, isang Irish woman. She was 17 years old. Si Dr. Zarizal was 35 years old. They lived as husband and wife although hindi na sanction ng Catholic Church at that time ang kanilang uh, kasal. Nagdalang tao si Josephine Bracken, subalit yung anak nila ay uh, iniluwal na premature at namatay. And nobody knows kung saan dito inilibing yung batang yon. So today, join me as we retrace the footsteps of the national hero where he spent four years of his life shortly before he was executed in Bagumbayan. Ito po yung entrance sa Rizal Shrine dito sa Dapitan City. Ito po dati ay property ni Dr. Jose Rizal, 16 hectares which he acquired when he arrived here in 1892. At dito po siya nagtayo ng bahay. Ngayon pong araw na ito, bibisitahin po natin ang Rizal Shrine. At titignan natin yung mga replika nung mga bahay na itinayo ni Dr. Jose Rizal. Ang ibang puno po rito ay uh, mas matanda pa kay Dr. Jose Rizal. Hala kayo! Tignan natin ang Rizal Shrine na kung saan ang ating dakilang bayani, si Gato si Rizal, ay nanatili ng apat na taon bago siya tumulak papuntang Cuba, subalit hindi natuloy at nagtapos sa kanyang kamatayan sa Bagumbayan. Nasa loob na po tayo ng museum ni Dr. Jose Rizal dito sa Dapitan City. At ang unang bumungad sa atin ay itong nakaukit na liham niya sa kanyang mga magulang at kapatid bago siya itinapon sa dapitan. At ang sabi niya, mahal kong mga magulang at mga kapatid, mamayang gabi o bukas ay tutungo ako sa dapitan kung saan ako ipapatapon. Masaya kong tutungo roon dahil alam kong kayo'y pinagaloban ng kalayaan ng general at sapagkat naniniwala akong saan man ako maparoon ay lagi akong nasa kamay ng Diyos na siyang may hawak sa kanyang kamay ng kapalaran ng tao. Sa walong araw ng pananatili ko rito sa Kuta Santiago, tinrato ako ng mabuti at wala akong maireklamo ukol dito, maliban sa kawalan ng kalayaan. Ngunit hindi makakamit ng sabay ang lahat ng bagay. Ang inyong anak at kapatid na nagmamahal sa inyo ng buong puso, Jose Rizal. Dito sa loob ng museo, makikita po natin yung dalawang naiwan pang mga damit, original na damit ni Dr. Jose Rizal. Ang isa po rito ay pantulog niya, kulay uh, brown. Ang uh, isa po ay uh, semi-formal na damit. So mukhang mahilig sa brown si Dr. Jose Rizal sapagkat uh, puro brown ang kulay ng kanyang uh, pantulog at sa kanyang damit. Ito pa po yung isang damit ni Dr. Jose Rizal, yung kanyang coat. So hindi pala siya kalakihan sapagkat uh, kung may kukumpara niyo ang aking katawan, mukhang mas malapit pa yung aking balikat kaysa balikat ni Dr. Jose Rizal. So hindi pala kalakihan si uh, Gato Jose Rizal. Lingid sa kaalaman ng karamihan, hindi lang doktor si uh, Dr. Jose Rizal. Isa din po siyang uh, magsasaka. In fact, as early as 1892, eh uh, nagninegosyo na siya ng abaka. Tinulungan niya yung mga magsasaka ng uh, Sambuanga del Norte na mabenta yung kanilang produkto at makaiwas sa monopolyo ng mga Chinong negosyante. Siya po ang pinakaunang uh, nag-organize ng cooperative movement dito sa Mindanao. At makikita nyo, meron silang kakao, abaka, kape, kopras, mais at tubo. So ganyan po katindi yung uh, kaalaman ni uh, Gato Zarizal. Ito po yung working table ni Dr. Jose Rizal. At obviously, itong nakatayo na ito ay uh, uh, ginagamit niya sa kanyang pagdrawing. 
Ito pa yung original na Thai bowl actually. So makikita nyo na na-preserve po ang uh, mga ari-arian ni uh, Dr. Jose Rizal 127 years after he came here. Noong October 1896, inilulan sa isang barkong ang pangalan ay Colon, si Dr. Jose Rizal, upang ibalik sa Manila. Ito na yung unang bahagi ng kanyang biyahe papuntang Cuba. Subalit, hindi po natuloy ang kanyang biyahe sa Cuba. Ibinalik siya sa Manila at doon po sa bagong bayan, nagwakas ang kasaysayan ng ating dakilang bayani. Ito po ang Casa Redonda. Ito po ang nagsilbing clinic ni Dr. Jose Rizal at dormitoryo ng kanyang mga estudyante. Noong dumating si Josephine Bracken sa dapitan, dito po tumira si uh, Josephine Bracken sa gusaling ito na walo ang sulok. Etong puno na ito ng kahoy na ang pangalan ay Balono ay tumutubo na noong dumating si Dr. Jose Rizal sa dapitan. Tinatayang ito ay mahigit na dalawang daang taon na. So you can just imagine, siguro pagising ni Dr. Jose Rizal nung araw, eh nakikita niya na itong puno na ito at naihipo niya na itong puno na ito. Ganyan po kaganda itong Rizal Shrine sa dapitan sapagkat napangalagaan talaga yung mga bagay-bagay na itinanim, ipinundar, pati yung mga kahoy na tumutubo na bago pa man dumating si Gat Jose Rizal. Ito po yung Casa Residencia. Ito yung bahay ni Dr. Jose Rizal. Tumira siya rito noong uh, 1893 pagkatapos itong uh, ipatayo. At nilisan niya ito noong 1896. Hala kayo, akitin natin ang bahay ni Dr. Jose Rizal at tignan natin kung ano ang nasa loob ng uh, makasaysayang bahay na ito na tinirahan ng isa sa pinakadakilang Pilipino at malayo. Ito po yung bahay ni Dr. Jose Rizal. At makikita ninyo, malawak ang uh, loob at sawali yung dingding. Uh, hindi na po ito yung original. Actually, replica na ito ng bahay ni Dr. Jose Rizal na ipinatayo. No? Uh, subalit, uh, ganito po ang uh, pagkagawa ng bahay na yun. At uh, talagang ito po ay faithful uh, replica of the original house of Dr. Jose Rizal. Makikita ninyo na talagang uh, malinis ang pagkagawa, mahangin, uh, maaliwalas at makikita nyo rito pati yung kanyang uh, banyo na uh, nandito ay eh, nakakabit sa bahay. Ito po yung mga original pa na uh, China Wear na malamang ay eh, mas batanda pa kay Dr. Jose Rizal yan. At doon sa baba, makikita natin yung kanyang kusina. Uh, yung kusina ni Dr. Jose Rizal ay eh, uh, nakahiwalay sa kanyang bahay at uh, doon sa bandang kanan, makikita natin yung dalawang uh, hospital house. Uh, ang isa ay panlalaki at ang isa ay pambabae. So magkahiwalay po yung uh, uh, pagamutan uh, at uh, makikita ninyo na talagang uh, magandang pagkagawa. Dito po nagwawakas ang pangatlong yugto ng ating programang The Beauty and Bounty of Mindanao. Ang kagandahan at likas yaman ng Mindanao. Subalit sa episode na ito, meron po tayong napulot na aral. Dito pala nagumpisa sa kasaysayan ni Dr. Jose Rizal ang bias against Mindanao. Yung bang kapag hindi ka kanais-nais, itatapon ka sa Mindanao. So ang impression is, Mindanao is a place of exile and banishment. But as we have learned in the story of Dr. Jose Rizal, Mindanao is not as bad as others would like to believe it is. In fact, it was in Mindanao where Dr. Jose Rizal found peace and love. Sa ngalan po ng pangkalahatan ng Mindanao Development Authority, ako po si Secretary Manny Pinyol, nagpapasalamat. At nagasabing, in Mindanao, you will find peace and love.
live participants in, in the comment section. To do so, just type in your name, affiliation, to whom your question or questions is or are So to start, we will have the invocation first to be followed by the national anthem. Both will be played via audio visual presentation. Mathematics, Mathematics Education, Doctor of Philosophy in Mathematics, Doctor of Education, Doctor of Management, and Doctor in Public Administration. Prior to becoming a president, he has a wide experience in the academic leadership as he started his career at the Central Mindanao University as Director of Instruction, Vice President for Research and Extension, OIC Vice President for Administration, Consortium Director, Director of Research and as the Vice President for Academic Affairs. He is also a Senior Accreditor of the Accrediting Agency of Chartered Colleges and Universities in the Philippines or AACO. On top of these, he has been a recipient of various scholarships, fellowships, and awards at the national and international levels. Due to his excellent leadership, he has transformed Caraga State University into one of the top state universities in the Philippines. Everyone, if you may, let us all welcome a great leader himself, Dr. Anthony M. Penaso. A warm virtual round of applause, please. Thank you, Jodeline, for that very generous uh, introduction. My cordial greetings to the Honorable Secretary Emmanuel Pignol, Chairman of the Mindanao Development Authority, Dr. Anisito C. Orbita, Jr., 
President of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Dr. Rowena P. Barella, CSU Vice President for Research, Innovation and Extension, distinguished resource speakers who will be introduced later. A pleasant afternoon. At the outset, uh, I would like to welcome everyone to this seventh annual Mindanao Policy Research Forum, now co-organized and hosted by Caraga State University. This forum is one of the key events of the Mindanao Knowledge Center Network in celebration of the Development Policy Research Month. At this juncture, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the PIDS and the Mindanao Development Authority for considering Caraga State University one of the member academic institutions of the MKC network as co-organizer and host of this year's forum. This forum contains decision makers, researchers, academics, and representatives of the government, private and business sector, and civil society organizations to discuss important issues under the annual theme. This year's forum is anchored in the theme, Reset and Rebuild for a Better Philippines in the Post-Pandemic World. This theme is indeed fitting, relevant and timely as we gear towards transitioning to the post-pandemic era. Coping and rebuilding Mindanao strategies and innovative ways relevant to our new normal initiatives to address the impact of COVID-19 pandemic are central to the forum. Undoubtedly, research-based and data-informed policy must be put in place and enforced in all levels of social activity to serve its role as a prime mover of development. Indeed, policies can make or break, policies can build or destroy, as such, our country needs to reposition itself in order to respond to the challenges brought about by this unprecedented human crisis, characterized by so much volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Many scientists believe that COVID-19 will cease to be a pandemic and it will eventually become endemic. By endemic, it means that it will consistently be present, but limited to pockets of the global population, and there will be occasional disease flare-ups or outbreaks, the spread and rates of which will be predictable and manageable. The achievement of the goal of zero COVID-19 infection is an impossibility. COVID-19 is there to stay. That is why we must learn to live with it. Thus, beyond this transition, as cited in the concept note of this year's theme, governments will have to focus more on setting the right policies to support continuing epidemiologic improvements, removing inequities in and providing resources for the access to disease prevention and treatment, and incentivizing people to adopt better and more sustainable ways of life in a post-pandemic Department. As posited by Bill Gates, governments will always play a huge part in solving big problems. They set public policy and are uniquely able to provide the resources to make sure solutions reach everyone who needs them. They also fund basic research, which is a crucial component of the innovation that improves life for everyone. Three interesting plenary presentations are in store for us this afternoon. First, we have Reset and Rebuild for a Better Philippines in the Post-Pandemic World by Dr. Margarita de Boque Gonzalez, Senior Research Fellow of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Second, we have Developing a Sustainable Pathway for the Philippine Nickel Sector by our very own Dr. Ramel A. Serunay, Director Center for Research in Environmental Management and Eco-Governance, and also concurring Director of Read for Extension. Third and finally, we have the Coastal Community Social Enterprise at Sambuanga, Sibugay, 
by Mr. Roberto Balgon, a fisherman and community environmentalist. Responses from three different sectors are also in store from three invited discussants or panelists, namely Ms. Giseline A. Gingging, on tenement and environment, uh, tenement and environment manager of the Agatha Mining Ventures Incorporated, or simply AMBI in uh, Dubai, Agusan del Norte, representing the private sector. Engineer uh, Ramel A. Sanchez, my good friend, campus director of the Philippine Science High School, Caraga in Ampayun, Butuan City, representing the academe. And uh, Ms. Regina Salvador Antiquesa, executive director of the Ecosystems Work for Essential Benefits or ECOWEB, representing the non government organizations and civil society organizations. So, to end this welcome message of mine, allow me to quote Farid Zakaria, best selling author of the post American world, in his book, 10 Lessons for a Post Pandemic World. He said, So let's be clear as we navigate this pandemic and future crisis. People need to listen to the experts, but the experts also need to listen to the people. Indeed, policy development is a multi-stakeholder process that includes both experts and people. As Elizabeth Dole puts it, the best public policy is made when you are listening to people who are going to be impacted. May we find this forum in three eyes, informative, insightful and inspiring in resetting and rebuilding towards an equitable, sustainable, and resilient post-pandemic world. Mabuhay and God bless us all. Thank you very much, Dr. Penaso, for that warm and really inspiring welcome message. Now, to formally open this virtual forum, let me call on Dr. Aniceto C. Orbeta Jr., the president of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Dr. Orbeta Jr. has a PhD in economics from the University of the Philippines School of Economics, or UPSE, and did postdoctoral studies at Harvard University. He was a professional lecturer at UPSE and a visiting researcher at the Asian Development Bank Institute. He also served as a consultant to multilateral and bilateral agencies and principal investigator for the Innovations for Poverty Action. His research interests include education and labor market issues, social protection, impact evaluation, applied economic modeling, and information and communication technologies. Everyone, help me all welcome Dr. Aniceto Orbeta Jr. Let's give him a virtual round of applause, please. Uh, Mindanao uh, Development Authority Sec Chair Secretary Manuel Pinon, Caraga State uh, University President Dr. Anthony Pinasso, Caraga State University Center for Research in Environmental and Management Eco Governance Director Dr. Romel Serunay, Fisher Folk Leader and Community Inventorist, Environmentalist Mr. Roberto Cadodoy Balion. Uh, our very own uh, PIDS Senior Research Fellow, uh, Dr. Maria Margarita Gonzalez, Agata Mining Ventures Incorporated Tenement and Environment Manager, Ms. Giseline Gingging, Ecosystem Work for Essential Benefit Executive Director, Regina Sal Salvador Antiquesa, colleagues from government, academe, uh, civil society, the private sector, and all Mindanaoans joining us this afternoon, Mayong Hapon sa inyong tanan, and thank you for joining us in today's seventh Mindanao Policy Research Forum, or MPRF. For those attending the MPRF for the first time, this annual forum is a part of our collaboration with the Mindanao, uh, with the Mindanao uh, Development Authority, or MINDA, uh, which started in 2015. It is one of the key activities of the Development Policy Research Month, or DPRM. It, every September, the PIDS leads the celebration of the DPRM to promote the importance of policy research in crafting evidence-based policies, plans, and programs 
also want to Malacanang Proclamation 247 signed in 2002. This year uh, is our seventh uh, partnering with MINDA to promote evidence-based discussions of issues and opportunities in Mindanao. Each year we coined a theme that is usually based on uh, the DPRM theme and tweak it to suit the Mindanao's research and policy needs and priorities. Last year, for instance, uh, in support of the DPRM theme uh, on innovating governance for the new normal, PIDS, MINDA, and the Ateneo de Davao devised the theme bouncing back in the new normal through country development and agricultural resilience to highlight the importance of innovating the agriculture sector in Mindanao to sustain the country's food production amidst the COVID-19 pandemic and boost the sector's resilience to natural hazard and other risks. This year's theme uh, of our MPRF is Reset and Rebuild for a Better Mindanao in the post-pandemic world. And if you permit me to say it in Cebuano, pagtukod pag-usab paingon sa malambuong Mindanao pagkahuman sa pandemia. This theme emphasizes the message that to be able to rebuild from the COVID-19 pandemic and create a better Mindanao, we need to reset our paradigms and practices by balancing the interest of people, profit, and planet, or by placing equal importance on economic, social, and environmental well-being and sustainability. To this end, the government, business sector, academe, civil society, and the general public should pursue a shared vision of equitable, sustainable, and resilient post-pandemic Mindanao. The MPRF theme was based on the DPRM theme of Reset and Rebuild for a Better Philippines in the Post-Pandemic World. The COVID-19 pandemic has not only created an unprecedented health crisis, but also triggered a severe economic lockdown downturns globally, including developing countries such as the Philippines. Moreover, the widespread socioeconomic impacts are felt in all islands, including Mindanao. Based on the United Nations Development Program's socioeconomic impact assessment of the COVID-19 pan pandemic in the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao or BARM, the region has been badly hit, more so as it already has the highest poverty incidence in the country coupled with peace and orders, peace and security issues priority uh, prior to the uh, COVID-19 crisis. A survey conducted by the Japanese uh, International Cooperation Agency and the Ministry of Interior and Local Government in the BARM showed that the pandemic has dramatically affected the region in terms of accessing basic necessities and emergency needs as well as bringing foods and services to main markets due to restrictions in movements and transportation in and out of the region. Meanwhile, recent data from the Philippine Statistics Authority showed that the BARM reported an 8.2% unemployment rate, making it one of the six regions in the country that registered unemployment rates higher than the national average of 6.9%. To be able to cope with the economic impacts of the pandemic, the government has allotted funds to support projects, activities, and programs intended to respond to the pandemic and their Bayanihan to heal as one or Bayanihan one, and Bayanihan to recover as one, or known as Bayanihan two. Aside from this, it also provided financial and loan assistance programs, such as the Emergency Subsidy Program, the COVID-19 Emergency Loan Program Online, SSS Unemployment Benefits, the Land Bank Loans for LGUs, among others, to heal Filipinos during the crisis. Through the Mindanao Trust Fund Reconstruction and Development Project Phase 3, the World Bank also supported the Philippines, particularly the Mindanao's poorest areas. This project supported the construction of 13 smaller infrastructure projects, including multipurpose centers, agricultural facilities, agricultural trading and production facilities, access roads, and farmers' training centers. It also funded the construction of health facilities and stations with isolation facilities, birthing clinics, and community pharmacies to serve those who were infected by the virus in the region. The pandemic has not only affected the economy, the labor force, and the livelihood of people, it also impacted the environment, thus the need for Mindanao to adopt an inclusive environmental recovery plan. According to a news article, the volume of medical waste in the Davao region has increased in three months. Rad uh, Green Solutions Corporation, a Davao-based company that treats 
use personal protective equipment with each biomedical waste treatment technology called pyroclaim, claim that around 80% or an equivalent of 40 tons of the medical waste they collected from all COVID-19 facilities in the region were infectious waste. Projects such as the renewable energy uh, for Tawi Tawi seaweeds and the integ integration of productive uses of renewable energy for sustainable and inclusive energy generation in Mindanao or IPU or Mindanao are examples toward achieving greener and more resilient environment post pandemic. I am glad that the, through the MPRF, we could once again uh, share ideas and insights and learn from each other on how we should respond as a nation in facing this crisis. The MPRF is a vital avenue to showcase the wisdom and experiences of Mindanaoans. As a native of Mindanao myself, I, I am proud of the wealth of intellectual and social capital this region possesses. Let me end by expressing my sincere thanks to Min Minda for the warm partnership it has given PIDS through the years. We are also honored to have partnered with this year with the Caraga State University. We hope that this activity will open door to other meaningful collaborations in the future. Dagan salamat of mayong hapon sa inyong tanan. Thank you so much, Dr. Orbeta, for that very informative and motivating speech. This time, we will be hearing presentations from our distinguished set of presenters for our plenary session. Each presenter is given 15 to 25 minutes for their presentation. Our first presenter is Dr. Margarita de Buque Gonzalez. She is a senior research fellow at the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Her research interests are in the areas of monetary economics, financial economics, macroeconomics, and development. Prior to joining PIDS, she was an associate professor at the University of the Philippines School of Economics where she headed the Financial and International Economics Committee and the Union Bank Center for Financial and Monetary Economics. She also previously served as a consultant to various government agencies and international financial institutions and was country advisor for several years at Global Source Partners, which oversees an international network of independent economists. Dr. Margarita used to be a regular contributor at the business section of the Philippine Daily Inquirer, where she won numerous journalism awards for her special reports and feature articles on her PhD in economics from UPSE and her BS in psychology, magna cum laude, also from UP. Please hit the applause button and let us welcome Dr. Gonzalez in the spotlight. Uh, good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. I think Dr. Margarita is having connection problems. Of Margarita. Good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Doctor. Good afternoon. Uh, sorry. I think uh, okay. I, I have to turn on my turn off my video so I could have better reception uh, because I think okay. uh, I lost you uh, for a while. Uh, so I'll turn on off my video okay, so that. Uh, okay. Um, so. Um, Okay. Good afternoon. Um, this is uh, Margarita de Boque Gonzalez. I'm a, an economist and a fellow at PIDS, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. And I am here to present to you our paper on the theme Reset and Rebuild for a Better Philippines in the Post Pandemic World. This is a collaborative work between Dr. Adora Navarro, myself, and Dr. Chris Francisco Abrigo, 
and I, I think some of it, some of I think Dr. Navarre is around uh, to help me in the Q and A later. Um, uh, we drew inspiration from the Great Reset, uh, which was launched by the World Economic um, Forum last year, and uh, the goal was really uh, to rebuild the economy sustainably following the COVID-19 pandemic. So the goals of the Great Reset are threefold. One is to build um, new foundations for the world's uh, economic and social systems, um, steer the market towards fairer outcomes, and uh, promote investments that advance shared goals such as equality and sustainability. So the overall theme of our paper is resetting capital because COVID-19 has shown us the failings of the current capitalist system. And we realized that if we wanted significant change, then corporations and businesses also had to change. And that is why we are talking now about ethical business. And we define ethical business as business with a higher social purpose than just profits. Because um, we believe that uh, changing um, business mindset is critical to making headway in resetting and rebuilding for a better future after the pandemic such as through green and inclusive recovery and rebuilding a robust and healthy workforce. Okay, so that's uh, the chart that you see. The, the main um, theme is resetting capital, listen, and underneath our ethical business, green and inclusive recovery and a robust and healthy workforce. Now the table I'm showing on the screen right now is a summary of the existing capitalist systems we have all over the world. So basically we have three kinds, shareholder capitalism, state capitalism, and stakeholder capitalism. We can more or less ignore the middle column because those are countries like China and Vietnam where the key stakeholder is the government, and the government steers the economy, and government's interests are, are paramount, and business interests are subsidiary to state interests. Um, most uh, market, a lot of many market uh, economies, including the Philippines, fall under the shareholder capitalism uh, umbrella, where the key stakeholder is uh, the company shareholder or the, the business owner. And the key feature of this type of system, of this type of economic system, uh, is what we call the Friedman Doctrine, where uh, uh, 50 years ago, Milton Friedman, an economist, Dr. Milton Friedman, made a very powerful, uh, wrote a very powerful essay uh, in the New York Times where he said that the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits. And that has been sort of the mantra in, the, in, the, um, in many countries around the world. And uh, uh, for corporations, that uh, kind of corporate philosophy meant that you only needed to maximize profits. That's the only thing that you needed to do. Um, if you're a corporate board director, that's your only goal, and that's the only basis for making a decision, corporate decisions. Now, the WEF uh, is advocating um, for a shift from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. Uh, the difference uh, is that stakeholder capitalism uh, has all stakeholders as, uh, as key stakeholders, meaning all your stakeholders matter um, equally. And the key feature of that system is that you not only uh, consider business profits, but you also have to consider the goals of the wider society. In terms of our corporations, the implication is that you don't just maximize profits. That's not your only goal now. You, your goal is to um, maximize long-term value creation. And we're talking when we're talking about long-term value creation, we're really talking about the long-term value of your stakeholders. And since you're only you're not only maximizing profits, you're also maximizing other things, societal goals um, that are meant to um, uh, increase sustainability and increase equity. You need a measure for that, and so you need what we call ESG metrics. So some of you may be familiar with this. E means environment, S means social, and G means governance. And this metric measures how well a corporation is doing in adopting stakeholder values and meeting stakeholder goals. And the ideal here is to have just one measurement system and to have um, universal and comparable disclosures of companies so you can see which company is actually um, following the stakeholder principle. 
principle. Okay, so in shifting away from shareholder capitalism, if you do decide to shift away, you of course need to know what you stand to lose as well as what you stand to gain. Hello. Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, where did I? I know. Where Where did I um, disappear? <laughs> Which part? Uh, that present slide for them. This one. This slide. Marketing. Marketing. Okay, sorry. So if we want uh, to shift away from shareholder capitalism, we have to know what we're losing and what we're gaining. So we have this table here on the pros and cons of shareholder capitalism and stakeholder capitalism. The pros are that uh, shareholder capitalism is simple. You have clear accountability. You, you just have uh, this goal of maximizing profits. And so you, uh, with a simple goal, you have uh, uh, efficient decision making. You have a stronger incentive structure that fosters innovation. The cons is that shareholder theory only works under certain conditions. Now, what are these conditions? Well, this is sort of economic jargon. You need to have well-functioning markets, meaning you have competitive markets. There's no monopolist. You need to have complete markets, meaning there's no externalities. So um, your business activities don't negatively impact um, society. You don't uh, create pollution, for instance. Or if you do, then government should be able to address them. Uh, there should be complete contracts with stakeholders. So that minimizes uncertainty of your stakeholders. Uh, you pay them on time, you pay your workers on time, your creditors on time, pay them full. There's no minimal uncertainty on their part. And uh, agents care only about money. So meaning business folk only care about business profits. And most importantly, you're supposed to have a well-functioning government that sets the good rules, sets good rules of the game where the rules are correct and fair and you have a level playing field and companies are rule takers. There's no company that is able to set rules, for instance, through lobbying or through personal monetary or political influence. Now, the, the, the pros of the stakeholder capitalism have been growing because um, stakeholder capitalism, holding stakeholder values, is now seen as an ethical good. And it's believed to lead to better governance, uh, better uh, revenue growth, uh, because consumers respond to corporate philosophy. And it's supposed to lead to cost reduction, better resource management, uh, lower turnover of employees. And because of that, holding stakeholder values becomes a source of competitive advantage for businesses in the current day, which is what McKinsey and company has found out in a study in the developed world. The cons, of course, is that it's not simple. Uh, it's a complex uh, objective. You have uh, um, many societal goals. You have you lack a well-defined goal. And it may invite self-interested behavior where some corporations may just pretend to be socially responsible when they're not in the environment um, arena. We call that greenwashing, where um, companies just, you know, put on their labels that they're what sustainable or environment friendly when they're or actually not. So it may invite that kind of behavior. Um, and uh, also importantly, if you take money from the company, from profits and put it in a socially uh, responsible project, that may be construed as expropriation because that money really belongs to the shareholder supposedly. And then you're spending it. And so that is tantamount, um, some argue to taxation without representation. In fact, that is one of the most powerful arguments of uh, Milton Friedman. Now, uh, looking at the Philippine corporate landscape, especially during the pandemic, 
there seems to be, even without shifting capitalist uh, or economic systems, uh, it seems like businesses are starting to look beyond their own bottom lines and that the legal and regulatory framework uh, seems to be uh, encouraging this kind of behavior. So we saw the Bayanihan spirit alive and well during COVID. You saw Philippine business leaders setting aside self-interest to help their employees and society, large manufacturing firms redirecting their factories to produce disinfectants, malls suspending their rents, companies um, um, donating personal protective equipment, private firms donating vaccines to the government, and so on and so forth. And in November 2020, we also saw the Philippine business group uh, sign what they called the Covenant for Prosperity, where they vowed that they would also consider the interests of all the stakeholders. Now, if you look at the, the legal framework, the regulatory framework, the seeds are there somewhat. Um, uh, in our corporate uh, governance code, we, um, the concept of a stakeholder was already introduced uh, in the first corporate governance code, uh, code in 2002. It was removed in 2009 for some reason, but share, um, minority shareholder groups were able to convince um, the SEC, the government, to bring it back. So it was uh, returned to the corporate governance code in 2014. And the codes that were issued thereafter for publicly listed companies and public companies and registered issuers both uh, include sections devoted solely to the duties uh, to Are you still there, Paul? Mm -hmm. Margarita. If Dr. Margarita is having um, connection problems. Hello, Dr. Margarita. Hello, yes. Uh, I am sorry. Okay, I'm, am I back? Yes, na narinig po namin kayo. Okay. Can you see my slide? Yes. Uh, uh, you can still see my slide? I'll blue load to that. We can what? see your slide, po, pero hindi po in presenter view. Okay. Uh, which slide did I... Uh, uh, which slide uh, was the last slide? Yan po, yung pong hopeful signs of businesses. Okay, so which part? Uh, the laws? The regulations? Yung bayanihan, ano po? Okay, so corporate government reforms in the Philippines. Uh, uh, so corporate governance reforms. So yes. I'll just summarize it so it's quick. So the seeds for stakeholder are there. The stakeholder concept is already in the code, but it's not in the corporate uh, revised corporate code of 2019. Um, so there are many reforms. Uh, publicly listed companies are now required since 2019 to disclose sustainability issues. Uh, we basically uh, have adopted soft laws. Uh, not this, is not a, a derogative, uh, a derogatory term. It's 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 a it's a technical term. It's a soft law. It's not a hard law. So um, 
So they have simply adopted what we call a comply or explain approach, meaning if uh, publicly listed companies, for instance, are not able to to disclose uh, their sustainability issues, they are required uh, to explain to the public why they were not uh, able to do so. So they're simply required to disclose their non-compliance and the regulator simply assesses the reasonableness of their explanation. And we're still quite far from instituting stakeholder capitalism, rightly or wrongly, okay, uh, opinions differ there. Of course, some people would say that uh, the, the current soft law is actually the right law, uh, and but that's how it is now. So it's not uh, in your revised corporation code of 2019. Now, we don't really need to shift uh, um, systems. You don't really need to overhaul your system, your corporate laws, in order to pursue more inclusive and sustainable development. There are other ways to pursue this. One is through what we call inclusive business models or IBMs. This was this, um, studied in Poblador 2017. So Dr. Poblador was our guest a few uh, weeks ago and our own uh, economist, Dr. Roel Briones in 2016. Um, inclusive business models or IBMs provide low income communities access to economic opportunities while making businesses more viable and sustainable. So the aim here is to put smaller enterprises into the value chain for big business to serve as suppliers, distributors, retailers, employees, or customers. This is a model that is already being promoted by DTI, where the priority areas have been agribusiness, housing, and tourism. And so now with tourism practically a shut sector, the focus will likely shift to agribusiness and housing. Um, in December 2019, the BOI was able to mobilize a total of $3 billion here with uh, engaging over a thousand marginalized individuals, a third of whom are women. So this has had some success. The other kind of business model that uh, also pursues inclusive and sustainable growth, many of you are familiar with this. These are your social enterprises. So this, the research we have seen there are Palesteras and Yanto, our uh, own PIDS economists also, uh, are um, Dr. Marifeb Palesteras and Dr. Gilbert Yanto and an ADB uh, study by Ito and Shanaz. Now, um, although typically small initially, social enterprises can be scaled up with the proper support and success, successfully linked to bigger inclusive businesses. Now, I find this ADB paper very interesting because it actually says that official development aid has declined as the Philippines is anticipated to graduate to high middle income status. So we actually lose funding when we graduate to a higher status. And there is now a growing need to find other funding solutions to meet sustainable development goals. So they argue that uh, social enterprises can fill that role. They argue that with the right enabling environment, social enterprises have the strong incent, uh, strong potential to create financially sustainable market-based approaches to achieve national and sustainable development goals. And they further say that this can be a magnet for innovative finance. So small social enterprises, small social enterprises can now, we're in a world where social enterprises can be a magnet for innovative finance, where you can use blended finance to access private sector capital or to avail of multilateral opportunities. So um, in the final um, analysis, the best solution, uh, we believe, weighing all the factors is that what you Doc Margarita. Hello, Doc. Nawala. Doc Margarita. Are you still with us, Paul?
Um, to all participants and guests, let us wait for a few minutes for Doc Margarita to join us again. She is having um, internet connection problems, which is really inevitable. Hello? Yes, Doc Margarita. Hello. Hello po. Okay. Yes, can po. you hear me? Yes, okay. po. Uh, sorry. Where did we leave off? Yung hybrid na part po. Why not hybrid? Okay. It's like. I'm sorry, I don't know why I have a uh, lousy connection now. Uh, it's okay, po. Maybe they're fixing. It's okay, po. Okay. Go ahead, Doc Margarita. Why don't we just have there? Is that okay? Can you hear me? Yes, po, Doc. Can you hear me? Yes, po, Doc. We can hear you. Po. Can you hear me? Yes, Doc. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so in the final analysis, as I said, uh, our own analysis is that weighing all the The edge is that you have a long term vision. Okay, you look at things like sustainability and you maximize profits for the long term. And taking into consideration your long term um, assets, your long term um, inputs, uh, your stakeholders. So your stakeholders can be considered as your investors, where your workers, for instance, uh, contribute what we call their sweat equity. And so that's what you're maximizing, the value of the firm, including the value of your long-term stakeholder. Um, so um, this is not something um, far-fetched. Uh, there's actually a similar paper I found out later that actually says the same thing, which is a paper by a famous uh, economist, uh, Agion et al., uh, based on the taxonomy for capitalism of Asimoglu and Soskis and Hall. And so there are basically two types of capitalism, um, cutthroat capitalism, according to the taxonomy of Asimoglu, cutthroat capitalism and cuddly capitalism. Okay, so cutthroat capitalism uh, uh, includes your liberal market economies. So it's called cutthroat capitalism because there's very high competition. The best example of that is the U.S., where um, there is high incentive for technological advancement, but there's likely to have high in inequality also. The other kind of capitalism is what we call cuddly capitalism or your uh, coordinated market economies. And the best example of these are your German um, and Nordic countries, Germany and the Nordic countries in Europe, where they have strong mechanisms for income distribution and a wide social safety net but you have, they have tend to have weak incentives for innovation. And so Agyan said the same thing. We can actually all move to the center where the U.S., uh, the cutthroat capitalists can move closer to a cuddly capitalist um, arrangement and vice versa. Okay, so um, this has been a very hard uh, topic to write and now a hard topic to present. Uh, but I, we did come managed to come up with broad takeaways. One is that success in this area in achieving good capitalism will depend on the willingness of companies to renew their corporate purpose. And this is reflected by their willingness to for an equitable and sustainable economy. The caveat is that ESG metrics should be reevaluated. So this issue came up in our webinar a couple of weeks ago where um, uh, it was raised that maybe the metrics that you have are more suited for advanced uh, economies, and maybe you need to tailor it for developing economies. Relatedly, regulators must be sensitive to each firm's capacity to adopt these ESG measures, because it will only widen inequality if only the already very successful and very large companies are the only ones who can meet these metrics. So th the goal ultimately is to find a better balance between uh, efficiency and equity. And today's economy, uh, which is vulnerable to catastrophes and pandemics, to find a balance between incentives for innovation and the need for social protection. Um, another broad 
uh, takeaway is uh, you should have more, uh, corp do more in terms of reforming corporate governance and encouraging market uh, participation and widening um, corporate ownership because this is one way to spread the wealth in in the in the in society in the economy and it's also one way to strengthen the internal and external sources of discipline for companies especially the very large ones okay so how the the the, the question we pose is how can markets drive businesses to do good if market power is i mean a voter power of minority share, shareholders is too small and right now we have uh, about 10, 20 percent uh, supposedly to be listed, but uh, companies uh, don't all do that. Now, a third uh, broad takeaway is that the country's competition framework should be further strengthened to create an equal environment for different businesses and similar industries. So we already have a law for this. We have your Philippine competition law and we already have an institution uh, set up. Uh, but Still, we could do a lot more so that market uh, power can be curtailed and uh, and uh, make things better for all of us. The last broad takeaway is that continued reforms in the more traditional areas of employment, uh, education, and taxation have to be uh, pursued. This should not be forgotten because this is the traditional way that you try to bring down inequality. Now, uh, with renewed corporate purpose, it becomes easier to pursue the two other to-dos in a capital capitalism reset, which are implementing a green and blue economy and developing a robust and healthy workforce. In nurturing a green and blue economy, social issues may be more complex now than imagined by Friedman in his day when he said that the only responsibility of business is to make profits. Now we know that profit and damage may be inextricably linked by technology, in which case corporations may have a comparative advantage in being socially uh, responsible, meaning it's easier and cheaper for polluters to simply stop polluting. And uh, why go roundabout way of giving the dividends and then letting uh, the shareholders contribute uh, to, let's say, an anti-pollution fund when you could uh, attack the problem directly? And that's the kind of thinking, and that's how a lofty goal like building a green and blue economy can, in fact, materialize. Now, what is a green economy? A green economy is an economy that is low carbon, resource efficient, and socially uh, inclusive. It is an economy that results in improved human well-being and social equity, while significantly reducing environmental risks and ecological scarcities. So, um, the blue economy is a newer concept. It's an emerging concept that encourages better stewardship of our oceans or of our blue resources. And in a sense, the blue economy is part of, of the green economy. And the World Bank defines it as the, as the sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods and jobs, and ocean a green and blue economy um, Building resilience entails conservation of green and blue ecosystems, as well as um, climate change adaptation and mitigation. Unfortunately, the conservation strategies of the Philippines are somewhat inadequate, inadequate if just opposed with the targets. If you in life below water, the country is actually stagnating. And for SDG 15 life on land, we are actually decreasing, according to a study by Sachs et al. Um, climate targets and well-being tar targets should, can be seen as complementary, and you can hit two birds with one stone, so, so to speak. In the areas of food security, energy uh, development at use, waste management, conservation of green and blue uh, systems, repairing for climate change related diseases, pandemic recession, we constantly talk about the need for a fiscal stimulus to spur growth. And the idea has caught on and has been the idea of a green recovery. IMF is talking about green infrastructure. ADB has recently focused on financing a green and inclusive recovery, which they said is not only beneficial,
charity anymore, but about making money. So there are investment opportunities in a green and blue economy, particularly um, in this area, climate smart infrastructure, which is a promising area for public private partnerships, PPPs. Um, you can, um, these are good ideas, climate change mitigation projects, which are energy efficient projects, energy efficiency projects, and greenhouse gas emissions reduction technology adoption. Uh, climate change adaptation projects are also uh, uh, um, natural candidates. You have design, build, operate projects that mm -hmm. anticipate climate uncertainty, for instance, hydropower projects that consider water flows or shortages. And then you also have resilience building infrastructure projects, which is meant for disaster prevention, disaster preparation, disaster readiness. All these uh, uh, in the form of beach mango forest reforestation, floods, spillways, canals, seawalls, uh, etc. The other big to do in a capitalism reset, <coughs> sorry, before that, In shaping green initiatives, uh, these are the recommendations uh, written by Dr. Navarro. Um, you have uh, the following recommendations. Uh, we should make space for greening of stimulus packages. We should identify and invest in green growth opportunities, such as tap tapping the ASEAN Catalytic Green Finance Facility and the Green uh, Climate Fund. You know, and find alternatives, for instance, on the issues surrounding carbon taxes. So I, this is the same issue we uh, talked about earlier when metric uh, and, and underrating. Uh, so an example is carbon, where if you um, emphasize too much on environment impact, that could raise the cost, let's say, of electricity, power, and that could... Uh, um, impact the poor and it could impact on your competitiveness as a country. And so the social impact uh, maybe should be weighted upwards. And that's what we're saying when maybe let's try to revisit how the metrics are um, made. Now, the other big to do in a capitalism reset is uh, developing a healthy, a robust and healthy uh, workforce. COVID-19 highlighted the health inequities faced by low compensation workers as they are more likely to encounter poor work-related conditions. So they are more likely to live in crowded conditions or in areas with high levels of pollution, take congested public transportation, lack the financial resources to afford aggregate protection, feel compelled to work even when they're sick because the opportunity cost of not working is high. And they also While digitalization and the fourth industrial revolution have uh, facilitated the transition to remote work and distance learning, differences in the ability to access these technologies have exacerbated existing inequalities among households and across countries. So there should be the following, yeah, rethinking of social protection, focus on health at work, reimagining school and future-proofing education, reskilling revolution, um, closing gaps such as your digital divide, gender gap, youth, unemployment. Um, COVID-19 saw an acceleration of employment trends that are already there before. So adoption of e-commerce by business, transition of displaced workers to different jobs, highlighting need for upskilling and reskilling, rise of the gig economy, and acceptance of a work from home setup by uh, companies. So what are the lessons for the Philippines? So this uh, is the part written by Dr. Abrigo, Francisco Abrigo. And the following are, uh, are what we need to remember. One is we should invest heavily in reskilling and upskilling programs. I think this cannot be overemphasized. Rem um, remember, we talked about, we like to talk about economic scarring. Um, it's where productive capacity or potential of your economy weakens because your factors of production have weakened, meaning your business capital and human capital have diminished. Your workers have lost their skills because of the long, prolonged unemployment or your workers are in sectors that have shut down like tourism. And so lacking the skills needed to get back into the job market and go into other sectors. So that needs to be addressed. The 
sectors has to be facilitated if we want our economy to grow robustly again. This is the medicine that we need to apply. We need to reskill or upskill our, our laborers. And as a macroeconomic economist, that's really something I believe in. Um, the other one is to revamp the social protection system to cover the growing employment in the gig economy and strengthen health support programs. Um, improve digital readiness and address the digital divide and invest in the future workforce. It's a hard to do list implementing a green and blue inclusive economy and a robust and healthy workforce, but I hope our team has presented a good enough roadmap. As we know, nobody needs to remind us, we know it very well that the devil is in the details. But uh, as a speaker in our one of, one of our webinars, Dr. Tata, uh, the intention must be there. And it has to come from all of us, business, government, and civil society. So uh, those are the highlights of our discussion paper. Before I go, let me leave you with a meme. My, my kids love memes. Here the scientist tells Michael J. Fox, Marty, whatever happens, don't ever go to 2020. So pang pasaya lang po, I really shouldn't be joking because it is the worst year for many of us, especially those who lost loved ones. But we do have to look for silver linings and one silver lining of the pandemic is this. Government, business and civil society to reset and rebuild for a better Philippines in the post-pandemic world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gonzalez, for that very informative talk. We are down to our second presenter. Our second presenter is Dr. Romel A. Saronai. He is a professor of the Environmental Science Department at Caraga State University. Dr. Saronai is a marine science researcher with an H index of seven. He finished the degree PhD in marine science at the Marine Science Institute, University of the Philippines, Diliman, Quezon City. Currently, he serves as an associate editor of the Journal of Ecosystem Science and Eco Governance. In addition, Dr. Saronai is the director of the Center for Research in Environmental Management and Eco Governance at the same time, the Director of Extension Services and Technical Advisory Office. Lastly, he is an associate member of the National Research Council of the Philippines, Biological Science Division. Everyone, let us all welcome our second presenter, Dr. Romel A. Serena. Can we all give Good evening, everyone. Sir Nye, I'm, I'm Romel Romel from, from Caraga University. University. I'm, I'm really, really thankful, thankful to, to the organizer. organizer of the 7th Mindanao Policy, Policy Research, Research Forum, uh, especially Minda, for inviting us to share our initiatives on developing a sustainable pathway for the Philippine health sector. This is being funded by TOSD PSERD, and this is implemented in, part in partnership with the British Geological Survey in UK. Allow me to give you a brief background about the Project Proposal Development Grant. The core of this project is a Strategic Environmental and Social Assessment, or CISA, for attaining the Sustainable Development Goal of Producing Clean Nickel. This tool will ensure environmental and social sustainability and highlight any likely significant effects of plans, policies, and programs in the region. This partnership focuses on creating an interdisciplinary understanding of mining in the Philippines, the interaction between the key players and stakeholders, the perception of current mining practices in the local community, and the impact on the environment. We identified Caraca region as the pilot site of this project because Caraca region has the largest nickel deposit in the Philippines, and it is also known as the mining capital of the Philippines. It has economic contribution of 22% of the regional GDP and currently hosting 14 active nickel mining projects. To assist the Philippines' current sustainable nickel mining scenario, 
a CISA approach was adopted. For the methodology, we conducted the focus group discussion and key informant interviews of invited stakeholders and resource speakers during the national and regional stakeholders online forum. These reviews from academic databases were performed based on preliminary findings related to environmental, socioeconomic, and governance issues in mining. Stakeholders from various government agencies, mining industries, and academe were invited to present crucial topics related to the workshop's goals. The source of the series of workshops conducted during the PPD grant reveals that there's really issues and gaps relative to mining governance, environmental, and socioeconomic aspects. Now, for the governance aspect, there's a communication gap, meaning some members of the community are not aware in the development of the area. There's also a lack of education of the stakeholders in mining laws and policies, lack of understanding of the stakeholders dynamics, the stakeholder ecology, and there is no feedbacking from the representative to the members of the stakeholders group. It is the root cause of misunderstanding among stakeholders if there is lack of understanding in a stakeholders power and influence which can change over time. For the gaps in environmental aspect, the groundwater is not included in routine monitoring protocol. The frequency of monitoring and parameters is not fully defined. The hexavalent chromium already reported to be elevated in waters of Claver's Regal del Norte, and the real status of hexavalent chromium contamination is not known. There is really a lack of experts in the conduct of monitoring activities. And then, mining rehabilitation plan may not be sustainable and acceptable to the community. The implementation of the rehabilitation program in relation to the external stakeholder demands and the rehabilitation program is expected to interconnect with the natural and human dom dominated ecosystems in the vicinity. For the socioeconomic aspect, there's a gap for the current social impact assessment process is not inclusive and comprehensive. Beneficiaries are not consulted on what they need. And there is no rigorous impact assessment of HDMP programs to the socioeconomic welfare of the communities. And lacks of understanding of the stakeholders' power and influence. Some of the stakeholders do not know their roles in the HDMP. In the forum during the project, project proposal development, the benefits of mining had been clearly manifested, particularly in the economic and social aspects. The mining industry has shown its compliance to the legal requirements. However, certain gaps were identified which are viewed as consequences of the lack of understanding in the stakeholder dynamics, inadequate stakeholder education, and limited stakeholder engagement. Now, stakeholder engagement underrated planning and implementation. There's also a transparency gap and reliability issues in monitoring and reporting. Environmental impacts of mining not fully addressed despite huge budget allotted for environmental management. Thus, there's a need to have holistic and innovative and forward-looking solutions. There's also a short-sighted economic projections. Thus, there's a need to interconnect with local economic development for holistic economic program to prepare for the life after mine. The needs that we want to address is to clean nickel production. And the best solution that we can offer is a CISA-based roadmap. The roadmap derives from CISA is necessary because the global market for nickel has become demanding in terms of environmental friendly nickel production. The electronic vehicle manufacturers and their clients seek to ensure that the raw materials used in their products are mined and refined in an environmental friendly means with positive impacts on local communities and with a lesser carbon footprint. The global market considers the producers 
ability to demonstrate that all requirements for clean nickel production are addressed throughout the value chain. These are related to the Sustainable Development Goal 12, which is responsible consumption and production. This provides the framework for this project. The nickel sector must be responsibly managed and meet long-term sustainable development goals by integrating environmental, social, and economic considerations. Why CISA, or Strategic Environmental and Social Assessment, and what is the difference between CISA and the conventional EIA? Now, EIA, or Environmental Impact Assessment, is a standard requirement for projects to be issued an Environmental Compliance Certificate in the Philippines to start project implementation, while CISA is a systematic process for evaluating the environmental implications of a proposed policy that provides means for looking at and appropriately addressing the cumulative effects alongside economic and social considerations of decision making. The nickel mining contributes substantially to the economy of the Karaga region, making it an excellent case study for CISA towards developing a roadmap for long-term responsible and inclusive development of the country. The general objective of this project is to develop a roadmap for the sustainable development of an expanding nickel sector in Karaga region as a basis for sustainable natural resource management elsewhere in the Philippines. The specific objectives are arranged per work packages. For the stakeholder engagement, this is to define and characterize the stakeholders and assess their power, urgency, influence, legitimacy, relationship, and sensitivities in the context of the pressures and impacts of nickel mining. For the baseline assessment, this is to generate baseline geological, environmental, social, and governance data as inputs for upscaling and scenario building and analysis for sustainable nickel mining. Innovative monitoring to design and develop localized ICT infrastructure, deploy and maintain sensors networks in the field, and capacitate local stakeholders on the utilization of generated technology. Special upscaling to employ GIS techniques, identify underlying relationships and tensions among parameters, and to determine key parameters that will affect sustainable nickel mining in a key study area. For the scenario analysis, this is to generate maps of the hazards and rest, extract future trends for possible development of the recovery of metals, and lastly for the CISA roadmap, this is to utilize the outputs of the various work packages for proposing an alternative mechanism adapting the CISA to ensure sustainability through a systems approach. These are the benefits that we could get if this project will be funded and implemented. More equitable and socially responsive social development and management program or SDMP. More engaged and more empowered stakeholders in innovative mine monitoring through citizen science. Well-targeted use of mining benefits to enable sustainable management of nickel mining and to prepare mining communities for life after mine. Clean nickel production for sustained economic benefits to Karaga region and the country. And lastly, nickel mines adopt the more holistic landscape approach in mine rehabilitation for biodiversity conservation, for healthy soil and clean air and water. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Recognizing Tad Dodoy for his inspiring determination in leading his fellow fisher folk to revive a dying fishing industry by creating a sustainable marine environment for this generation and generations to come.
and his shining example of how everyday acts of heroism can truly be extraordinary and transformative. It is my honor to give the spotlight to our third presenter, Mr. Roberto Ballon, also known as Kat Dalton. Uh, good, good morning, morning to everyone. everyone. Uh, Magandang sa, sa lahat. Ako si uh, Mr. Roberto Ballion, uh, uh, Coalition of uh, Municipal Fisher Park Association in Sambuanga, Sibugay Chairperson. At the same time, uh, KGMC or Kapunungan sa Gagmay Mangingisda sa, sa Conception. So this uh, our programs and project as a, fisher folk, a small fisher folk organization in Sambuanga, Sibugay. Now I... Uh, I will present to you the uh, the initiative of this uh, our organization uh, as a small fisher folk organization na naninirahan dito sa kay, kabaybayan ng uh, baybay ng Sambuanga Sibugay uh, especially ng ng kabasalan para maintindihan ano yung mga ginagawa namin dito at uh, pwede namin i-share sa inyo baka makatulong sa gagawin nating mga uh, balang araw na mga programa kung ano ang maganda dito. So ito yon mula kami sa coalition ng mangingisda so federation na kami ngayon pero nagsimula kami sa, sa isang maliit na organization at ito yung mga uh, for five namin so marami kami mga uh, katulong dito iba't ibang ayon siya ng gobyerno at mga institusyon at ito yung aming Sambuanga Sibugay Bay so mayroon kaming oral reps dito sa aming ecosystem sa dagat mayroon kaming si grasses mangroves at uh, within a uh, Sibugi Bay ay mayroon kaming uh, 13 coastal municipalities no out of 16 municipalities within Sambuanga Sibugay. So mayroon kaming uh, population na more or less mo, uh, 500,000 uh, coastal no uh, population. Then out of 389 barangay, uh, 127 are coastal barangay. So so kaya nga uh, yung uh, federation namin dito nagsimula no uh, sa maliit na mga uh, gagmay mangingisda sa, sa Conception or Ducky GMC in Cebu GB. So ano yung aming mga programa? Ito yon environment, natural resources, and human resource, utilization, management, and, and advocacy. So uh, may tatlo kaming malaking programa na inikutan. O na environment protection, uh, uh, mga mangroves, uh, livelihood and enterprise development, and people empowerment. So ano, -ano yun? Uh, so dito naka-anchor kami. Para magawa namin yung kung anong gusto namin mangyayari ay nagkaroon kami ng isang simpleng vision no. So yun ang vision namin. Tapos uh, mayroon kaming mission at mayroon kaming mga goals so. So ito yun ang naka-anchor no. Uh, yung naka-anchor sa vision mission goals namin. Dito kami nagsimula. Ito yung parang Biblia namin. Paano namin matupad yung aming mga pangarap bilang maliliit na mangingisda at uh, nabaon sa kahirapan at gusto makaahon. So ito yung una naming ginawa, environmental and uh, natural resources so uh, sa environment sa coastal ecosystem. Uh, so nagtatanim ang una namin ginawa. So nagtatanim kami ng mga maraming mangrove sa lugar at hindi lang basta-basta nagtatanim. Nagsimula kami sa pag-raise or sa paggawa ng mga nursery area ng iba't ibang ori ng mangrove. So yun ang tinanim namin sa lugar na lahat na, na, na nasira noon at na nirehab namin at yung mga na over-exploited na mga area. So ito yun. So gumamit kami ng iba't ibang uh, paraan ng uh, technology at innovation para magawa yung aming mission na to plant more mangroves or maibalik yung mangroves sa aming lugar dahil ito yung dahilan ng pagkawalaan ng mga isda ng pagkawalaan ng mga mangroves so uh, after we have already planted more mangroves or expand our plantation of mangroves so the different kind of uh, uh, marine species so bumalik sila ulit so uh, kami rin ang nakikinabang sa ngayon no? so ito yon so maliban sa pagtatanim na ng mangrove so hininto din namin yung aming mga illegal fishing activities in the area karon kami ng sa mutsaring mga illegal fishing orientation and appreciation na katulong ang iba't ibang ensya ng ating gobyerno lalong lalo na yung ating nasa BFAR uh, din or at saka uh, local government unit no ng aming ng kabasalan ng aming uh, munisipyo at isa rin sa ginawa namin so marine endangered species protection sa din yan sa uh, kasi environment kasama yan sila sa, sa ecosystem natin no so yun ang una yung sa environment so talagang nalagaan namin yan at uh, protektahan ng ganga yon lalo sa mangroves at yung mga uh, uh, ng, ng, ng mga illegal activities namin sa dagat nito talaga namin so ano ang pangalawa naming programa itong livelihood and enterprise no community livelihood and enterprise so 
nag-establish kami, nag-promote, nagagawa ng mga iba't mga ori ng mga livelihood para uh, makaagapay at makaahon kami sa kahirapan. So ano yon So maliban sa pangingisda yung fishing, meron din kami mga seaweeds doon sa iba't ibang lugar na uh, coastal area na itinuro namin. At dito rin sa aming lugar din mismo, meron kami mga iba't ibang ori ng mga produkto, dried fish, blue crabs, o iba't ibang ori. May mga aquaculture or livelihood enterprise kami tulad ng aquaculture or fish cages, mga lapu-lapu, mga lobster, mga alimango, mga uh, oyster or saraba. So yon mga high value lahat yung aming ginagawa. So maganda na nga uh, sa huli, maganda na nga yung mga mangroves namin sa labas at uh, maraming livelihood. So yung mga basura naman, medyo uh, yun ang, ang hindi maganda. So ginawa namin paraan na magkaroon ng solid waste management din. So mayroon kami mga initiative na kami mismo ay nag-iipo namin mga basura at uh, humahakot pagpunta doon sa mga kung saan siya pwedeng dalhin at uh, ihagis na sa tulong na aming pamahalaan ng, na lokal. No? So yun. So mayroon din kami mga partnership sa iba't ibang uh, ahensya ng, ng gobyerno. Mayroon kami mga iba't ibang programa para uh, mayroon kami mga ibang ibang design, mga, mga business model. So mayroon kami mga sa pag may kita, may mga sharing scheme kami, uh, may mga structure kami sa organization para paano paganahin at mas lalong mamanage pa yung aming mga programang ginagawa. So marami kaming mga uh, ginagawang mga strategiya, mga, mga pag-re-record uh, or paggawa ng mga pinapakita na ito yung mga pwede pang gawin, ito yung pwede pang i-develop at ito yung mga dapat pang kailangan. So meron kaming uh, man-ops or operation manual. So manual operation pero ang, ang manual namin ay kailangan sa programa pala sa ayon sa aming uh, pagka sa experience dapat may manpower kami may ability networking ang partners which na hatsabi ko kanina upgrading of technology then accessories and linkage to market so isa yan sa mga ginagawa namin so hanggang sa federation ay inexpand namin ito at marami din kami mga uh, ginagawa pa so yun sa enterprise at sa sa aming mga uh, livelihood so Itong pangatlo yung human resource, so pa, yung people empowerment. So paano ba nagiging empowered kami? So sa pamamagitan ng mga technology or mga capacity building na access namin o binigay din sa amin ng mga different partners ng, ng, ng government organization, ng ating line agency, the government at iba't ibang partners pa natin. So kinakapacitate kami uh, to become an empowered uh, community or official folk. Uh, empowered uh, official folk community in the area to manage and protect. Uh, our uh, environment, coastal resources, and our livelihood and enterprise also the, uh, our organization. Kami ng mga uh, orientation sa katulad namin mga mangisda, yung mga magawaan ng mga mga illegal activities. So sinishare namin yung aming mga uh, experience kung paano kami naka kaahon sa itong pamumuhay no o sa ganitong paano namin MPG at sinishare namin hindi lang sa mga mangisda pati sa malalaking mga institusyon no? ako bilang chairman ay nagiging national uh, uh, gawad sa award ako no dahil sa ginawa natin so partner natin din yung mga iba't ibang malalaking mga kumpanya mga institusyon mga mga sa science no uh, sa mismo sa ating ensya eh to uh, at mga different uh, NGO and NPOs in the country So pero ito lang ang ang nakita namin na importante na dapat ikutan. So una, uh, environmental protection and management. Tapos uh, social uh, enterprise establishment and management. Then people empowerment. So ito yun kasi pag uh, maganda na yung enterprise mo kasi o livelihood like, dapat ang uh, um, dahil maganda rin yung environment mo at ito ay protektado at para magiging more protected ito at mas sustainable yung mga Uh, livelihood at environment, dapat may people empowerment ka or empowered community na mga ngalaga sa environment at para hindi ito maputol dahil ang empowerment ay hindi lang sa uh, dahil alam, may kaalaman, kundi dapat hindi nagugutom. So yun ang social or livelihood enterprise. So umiikot yan. Uh, hindi mo ma-empowered yung mga tao sa pagbabantay ng environment kung gutom sila. So dapat may livelihood. At dapat uh, para mas uh, empowered pa sila, dapat empowered sila sa magitan ng mga trainings at mga capacity building to uh, to more uh, uh, about uh, to know more about the environment no? so yan so before and after so dati ito yung mga naging result dati sa Bantay Dagat at sa mga facilities namin uh, yun lang at uh, after so may magandang bangka na kami may magandang mga uh, ano uh, building no before nagtatanim-tanim kami uh, unti lang yung aming inaragaan ngayon after so 
yung mayabang na aming mga tatapanan ay dumadami yung mga species at nagnegosyo na rin yung mga member natin. So dati ito yung lugar namin. Then after, uh, ito yung nangyari. After how many years lang? Uh, five to seven years. So kumanda ang lugar. So okay, kumpara mo after uh, uh, 2003, 2007, uh, 2013. So malaki ang tayong So ito yung isa sa sa, sa pinagayabang namin ngayon na uh, dapat masundan. At dahil dito, nagkaroon kami ng napakaraming uh, recognition no? and, and, and awards. No? So at ito ngayon din ay pinapaso, pinapasa namin sa aming mga second liners. No? So dapat may nakasunod na ito ay pagpatuloy nila sa ating mga anak o sa sunod pang mga generasyon itong aming mga ginagawa. So ito yon ang aming uh, structure sa, sa association na uh, hindi, hindi o basta official ka lang dapat marunong ka sa bilang opisyalis kung anong ginagampanan mo sa sa community o sa asosasyon na na pangkabuhayan or pang pangkalikasan. Oh, ito ngayon yung mga second liners namin, yung mga anak namin, sila sama namin at tinuturuan palagi. Ano yung mga ginagawa namin sa lugar kung bakit kailangan natin itong gawin para magiging uh, matupad natin yung ating uh, mission goals na sa darating na mga panahon. At uh, yung yun lang po ang 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 ano ko sa inyo may may pakita at sana ang recommendation namin dito although uh, marami na kami nagagawa pero napapansin namin bilang association sa lalo na sa aming lugar sa community na marami nga na tayong gustong gawin sa ating lalo lalo na sa barangay dapat or sa ating gobyerno dapat dito pa lang sa barangay base or sa mismo sa sa grassroots sinasabi kong barangay base ay dapat dito masimulan at dito magsisimula or dito uh, maggawa or ito yung sinasabi nating na na training ground ng ating mga uh, mamamayan para makaagapay at makakontribute doon sa national economy o sa national policies natin. So kung, kung titingnan mo, ito yung recommendation namin. Uh, ipanot ko lang, uh, sana at maintindihan ng lahat. Doon sa barangay, uh, napapansin natin uh, kami, kung mayroon tayong tinatawag na uh, uh, barangay uh, nutrition uh, workers or uh, 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 at, at saka itong barangay uh, uh, health uh, <clears throat> scholars no so yon sa 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 pag sa nutrition sa pagkain so meron tayong tao sa barangay na, na binibigyan ng ng uh, tao talaga o personnel at yung sa mga health naman yung sa uh, uh, BHW yung barangay health uh, worker so ngayon dahil sa pandemic at kahit wala pa nung pandemic nakita namin bakit wala tayong barangay agriculture agriculture officer o kaya barangay uh, uh, technical on on fishery o kahit ano man lang uh, barangay agriculture uh, agriculture uh, officer yun na napapansin namin uh, kasi sa tingin namin kung mayroon tayong mga sa grassroots pa lang o sa barangay na may mga ganitong tao or mga mga technical officer so dito pa lang nasisimula na tuturuan yung mga 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 tao no so So, 'yon ang isa namin nakita, no? So, dapat mayroon din uh, sa aming bar- nakita namin na dapat may may nakatutok talaga sa panahon na ito at sa darating pa na, na sa food uh, security natin at 'yung mga knowledge at skill na maipasa sa mga maipasa sa ating mga uh, young farmers, mga young fishers, mga women or mga fisher folk and farmers. So, dapat may tao na katutok sa kanila, hindi lang iasa doon sa Barangay Council kasi iba 'yung iba yung ano yung uh, gumagawa ng, ng mga palisya at iba din yung nakatutok sa sa teknika lalong-lalo na sa ating food uh, security at yung sa ating mga uh, mamamayan sa mga skills nila uh, how to uh, enhance their skills about fishing about aquaculture about farming about gardening about uh, uh, food uh, uh, security issues and uh, and safety no so yan po ang ano isa sa mga Uh, recommendation namin ay pa, at go, policy talaga kailangan natin ng more policy na itong mga ginagawa ng mga farmers at fishers na sa tingin na uh, tested and proven na ito yung sinusulong at ini-expand at pinupunduhan hindi yung uh, sa, uh, experience namin na palagi na lang nag-experience nag demo demo farm so okay yon pero ito pero dapat mas malaki ang pundo dito sa mga existing at proven na, na, na mga ginagawa ng mga community on the ground at ito'y palawakin ay expand kasi ito yung gumagana at kunting kunti na lang hila dito ay talagang uh, upskilling na ito ang ibig sabihin upskilling talaga so ang kulang natin ngayon policy automatic policy to support this lalong lalo na sa mga barangay doon sa ira sa munisipyo na, ma- na mapunduhan or mabigyan ng ng sapat na pundo taon-taon ang mga nag-exist nag-exist na mga 
uh, tested and proven technology and programs on project within the community, within the barangay, uh, or within the uh, uh, household. No? So yan po ang aking aming panawagan uh, bilang mga uh, mangingisda uh, dito sa Sambuanga, Sibugay. Sana uh, maparating natin ito sa mas nakararami at maintindihan ng ating mga mababatas, lalong-lalo na dito sa ating Mindanao Forum. So magandang umaga at magandang araw po sa inyong lahat. God bless at uh, sana iligtas tayo palagi. At uh, maraming salamat. Ako ulit si uh, Roberto Cadudoy Balyon. Ano pa salamat sa inyo at uh, sana uh, one Mindanao uh, magkakaroon tayo ng magandang kinabukasan hanggang sa buong uh, Pilipinas. Maraming salamat at mabuhay po tayo. At this juncture, we will be hearing the responses from the different sectors. The panelists have a maximum of 15 minutes each for their talk. Now, let me introduce to you our panelists. From the private sector, we have Ms. Jessalyn abonatas Gingbin, which is the Tenement and Environment Manager of Agatha Mining Ventures. Unfortunately, she can't be with us. In her behalf, here with us right now is Mr. Len Mark Tagud, ISO Compliance Officer of Agatha Mining Ventures Incorporated to represent. Let us all welcome Mr. Len Mark Tagud. Sir. Can you hear me, Pop? Yes, Pop. Can you see the my presentation already, ma'am? Yes, Pop. We can see your presentation. Okay. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. So, in behalf of uh, our Temepayo manager, Ms. Jessalyn Gingging, Island Mark Tago, the IS officer of Agata Mining Ventures Incorporated, will present to you this afternoon the environmental management programs of Agata Mining Ventures Incorporated. So, can you, can you see the screen already, ma'am? Yes, sir. Okay, so th this is the content of my presentation this afternoon. So we'll, I'm discussing to you who is Agatha, the transformative mine rehabilitation and reforestation of the company, the water resource management, the air quality management, the conservation values, the IEC research and development, and also the trainings and other activities. Okay, so. Our company, Agata Mining Ventures Incorporated, is, has been operating for, for seven years already. And uh, this is the company profile. So the first one is our Environmental Compliance Certificate Control Number. So it was issued on May 20, 2008, and it was amended on July 3, 2018. So the, our project current name is Agata Nickel Lateral Expansion Project. And... Um, uh, the, our president or general manager is uh, uh, Engineer Emilio Figueroa III, and we're situated at Barangay Lawigan, Tubay, Agusan del Norte. So Aga Tower Company is, is a joint venture among uh, Minimax Mineral Exploration Corporation uh, and Emerald Ni Nickel Philippines Incorporated and TV Resource Development Philippines. Okay, so why it was named Agata? So before there was an old tale retold from our IP community or story that Agata was it was an old logging ridge that many Agta is living. So it is a black, large, and tall spirit that usually dwell from a huge tree. So since then it was named as Agata. So yun po yung uh, po ng company name po namin. So the location and scope of our company. So we have, uh, as I said earlier, we're situated at Barangay Luigan Tuba Egusan del Norte. And we have three host communities, the um, Imurgado uh, situated at Santiago, Luigan in Tubay, and Tinigbasan also in Tubay. We have also five neighboring communities and uh, four IP communities, the Coro sector, the Airag sector, Agata sector, and Mapaso sector. These are all uh, Mamanua. Okay, so our company is also certified into IMS or ISO. So we, we are certified into three standards. 
the ISO 14,000 and 2015 or the Environmental Management System, the ISO 9,000 and 2015 or the Quality Management System, and the ISO 45,000 and 2018 or the Occupational Health and Safety Management System. So for our environmental management programs is a community-based implementation. So all of the uh, activities or programs such as EPEP or the Environmental Protection Enhancement Program, our operation, our SDMP or Social Development Management Program, our H, uh, SHNP or the Safety and Health Program, and the CRDP or the Community uh, uh, Realty Development Program is anchored towards our final line use plan that is uh, Agroforestry Mine Ecotourism Hub. So later on, uh, if we are going to um, rehabilitate, fully rehabilitate these areas, it will become an Agroforestry Mine Ecotourism Hub. So let's proceed with the Environmental Protection Program of our company. So uh, EPEP or the Environmental Protection Enhancement Program, this is required by the government which refers to the comprehensive and strategic environmental management plan for the life of the mining project on which the APAP are based on implement, implemented to achieve the environmental management objective. So every year, may tinatawag po tayo na AP, APAP. So ito po yung um, program to implement po yung environmental activities, mitigating controls to, to mitigate our negative impact to the environment. Okay, so these are the components of the EPP. So all of the mining companies are implementing this one. So we have the land resource management, the water resource management, the domestic waste management, air and noise quality management, conservation values, environmental research, trainings, and other activities. So for the land resource management, so we call it transformative mine rehabilitation and reforestation. So for the for the team to 2021, uh, this a total of 451 million of, of funds we, we expect spend for the implementation of our EPEP. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, so later on, the, this area or this mindset will be turned into agroforestry tourism hub. This is now the, the, the plan. So later on, this there will be a tree farm, production forest, the defined forest, the agri crops or for fruits and vegetables, banana plantations, coconut plantations, pineapple and papaya, and also with the tourism uh, concept. So right now, uh, our company is currently um, implementing tourism activities, landscaping activities, because uh, later on this will become an ecotourism. Okay, so for the land resource management, our implementation of the land resource management is. Uh, ISO base, all of our activities or processes is documented and you can see uh, the controls is already uh, um, uh, documented on how we mitigate our impact, negative impact to our environment. So we have for the land resource management, we have this procedure, we call it land resource management procedure. Um, uh, coupled with this procedure are the following work instructions, the clean and grabbing. Uh, topsoil dumping, plant production of planting stocks, and soil ameliorance production. So our uh, rehabilitation efforts also uh, a combined efforts of our mining operations and our field personnel also with uh, with all the departments here in our company. So for the land management, these are these are objectives for the reforestation. So we have to mitigate the soil erosion, the, uh, improve soil stability. Regeneration, restoration of the disturbed areas, restoration of biodiversity, preservation of endemic trees. So, part of our habitation activities, we plant endemic species of trees so that uh, there is a, a great uh, or a survival rate of our planted materials. Transformation of minor areas into agroforestry, tourism land, and in conjunction of CB, FMA, People's Organization. So, all of our rehabilitation and maintenance activities in the land resource management uh, is uh, together with, uh, we implemented it together with our people's organization. So we have also a central nurse, uh, uh, nurseries. We have two nurseries uh, located here in our site. One is this Ligaya Central Nursery, which uh, could cater uh, 600,000 seedlings. And also we have a Nursery uh, maintained by our one of our PO, the LAFA, 
which has a capacity of two to 25,000 seedlings. So in our nursery operation, we propagate endemic and bird feeding uh, tree species. And also, as I mentioned earlier, we involved the POS organization. Because uh, later on, if this will turn over to them, so they will, uh, the responsibility is already there now during the planting of the this uh, species or this species during our rehabilitation. So these are some of the photos of our uh, fruit trees and fruit bearing species uh, there in our nursery. And then uh, currently, as I mentioned earlier, um, part of our rehabilitation effort is the um, uh, rehabilitation through thematic landscaping. So ito pa isa sa best practices po ni Agatha is that we, we uh, rehabilitate through thematic landscaping. So these are some uh, photos of some of our landscaping initiatives. Uh, this one is the our the view deck of our general manager during monitoring. I think, uh, he'll uh, he'll go there and do monitoring, and also we have this view decks uh, here in our uh, admin areas. So makikita po natin yung uh, the actual many operations sa baba. Ito po yon. Wait lang. Medyo bumalik po ako, ma'am. No, sorry. Hello, ma'am. Hello? Yes, po. Sorry po, bumalik ako sa ano. Sorry, i-skip ko na lang ito, ma'am. Sorry. Okay, okay. Okay, nawal po muna. Okay, where am I? Okay. So these, some of the, these are the photos of our uh, thematic landscaping initiatives. This, this picture was uh, located in our nursery, here in our admin offices, and also, uh, yes, in the campsite. And we also had this, uh, before we had this uh, sunflower plantation. This is the view deck. And also currently we are, are uh, beautifying or uh, enhancing our uh, areas. Uh, this uh, we have uh, implemented uh, uh, constructed kubos for for relaxation. Uh, dito po uh, during break time, you my employees kapag relax. And also here we also um, enhance a uh, bahay kubo decorated with recyclable plastic materials in our some of our view decks. The next picture also is our uh, during our uh, Earth Day celebration, we had a contest with with all, with the employees. To, do, to beautify the kubos, existing kubos, and then um, this is located in our ornamental garden. So it's our coffee shop here in our site. And also this picture is uh, recycling activities of our employees during our competition on Earth Day celebration. And currently we are establishing or established hydrophonic facility in our site and vegetable garden at our mess hall, yung kainan po namin. And also at our gate, yung, yung gate po namin sa baba, uh, we also had the landscape activity. So using recyclable materials, plastics for the on sa area. And then of course, uh, kung meron din pa kami mga uh, Instagram Instagrammable area spots here in our site. So ito po yung part po ng tourism uh, project or initiative po namin. And also, here in our site, we also have this ornamental garden na pwede kayo may camping and all and other recreational activities. Here are some of the photos of our uh, Instagrammable areas. And for the um, soil ameliorance production, uh, all of the 100% of our food waste, uh, we convert it into a uh, vermicompost or vermicomposting para po to support our nursery operation. Okay. So this is some of the reforestation and rehabilitation activities po ng company. Currently, we are establishing banana plantation, na mention ko po to kanina, and also fruit tree plantation. And also currently, as mandated by the government, meron po tayong uh, bamboo plantation. And also, yan, some, uh, these are some of the photos of bamboo plantation here in our site. And some of the rehabilitated, rehabilitated areas. Ito po yung mga mine of areas na rehabilitate or final rehabilitate po ng, 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 ng company or ng department ng NVI. And also we have here, uh, during our uh, Earth Day celebration, the employees planted uh, this uh, uh, mango bearing, uh, uh, mangoes and also calamansi. So this is part of our 
spinal rehabilitation also. The photos of our uh, banana plantation, pineapple plantation, and currently we also had this uh, dragon fruit plantation. And of course, uh, part of the uh, initiatives or programs of the land resource management is that the company really involves employees during the three growing activities and IECs. Kasi uh, of course, since uh, we, we have to make them responsible po sa, since they are part of the company or they are, they are the employees of the company. So some of the, the pictures, we have this um, a tree growing activity during the Valentine's Day. And we had this um, program, the International Day of Forest. So yeah, uh, we also planted uh, trees together with employees and also contractors. And also part of the activity of the trust management is that last um, Arbor Day celebration, we had this community pantry uh, located uh, near the um, all homes in Butuan. So we were giving uh, vegetable seeds, ornamental plants, and high value crops to uh, mga tao na pumunta po doon. Okay, so uh, building sustainable, self-sustainable communities through partnership. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, all of our uh, land uh, rehabilitation and forestation activities partner po namin yung mga communities and the POs. So these are some of the mga activities na partner po sila. Yung pag establish po ng nursery and also its maintenance, plantation, reforestation, the NGP projects and car projects, the care and maintenance, the landscaping works. So hindi po kami nag-hire po dito ng mga landscaper, mga ano po sila, mga under the POs po yung nag-landscape dito. And also these are the three uh, POs na partnered po namin, yung Lawigan Farmers and Fisher Folks Association. Ito po yung PO sa isa namin host community. Tinigbasan Farmers and Fisher Fox Association, isa din po ito sa host community po namin, and also the Imergado Farmers and Fisher Fox Development Cooperative. Yan. And also, we have this uh, for partner activities like the nursery establishment, uh, plantation and maintenance, technical assistance. So, partner po din dito yung um, community po namin, uh, the, 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 our CRO or the Community Relations Office, uh, sa pag-implement po ng ano, um, uh, these are rehabilitation activities. Okay, and also for the coastal activities naman, we have this, uh, we partnered with women kasi po sila po yung gumagawa po ng isa namin controls doon po sa coastal for the uh, weaving of the silk curtain. Sila po yung nagtatahe. So tinigbasa ng women, the Wigan Women Organization, and the Mergado. Sa mga nami-maintain po dito sa mga areas, uh, nag-weaving, yung kinukuha po namin is yung mga kababa, uh, kababaihan dun sa uh, in the community. Then, uh, yung picture, uh, this picture is the actual picture uh, during the weaving of our uh, silk curtains. So, gamit po yan yung um, plastic bottles, siya po yung magsisilbing floater. Yung um, maglulutang. Yes po? Uh, sorry to interrupt, Mr. Tagot. Um, can you wrap up your presentation in two minutes? Okay, yes. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, I just uh, move on lang to other components. For the water resource management, po, these are our activities. Um, we have this air and noise quality monitoring, the water quality monitoring, the flora and fauna monitoring, and fish visual census. And this our this is the our controls to prevent uh, siltation and pollution. We install silt curtains and raft in the um, causeway areas po kung saan po nandun yung barges nagloload yun ng barges. And also, we install curtains po sa mga setting ponds. Ito po yung nagkocontain po temporarily ng maduming tubig before po siya i-release dito po sa discharge point po namin. And also, we're doing uh, uh, periodic uh, water quality monitoring sa mga sa coastal also sa um, fresh water na discharge area po namin. And sa waste management po naman, uh, we're implementing the solid waste and hazardous waste management in our site. So we are implementing yung tinatawag po natin na uh, 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 no simulation of collection sa so lahat po ng mga basura po ng contractors and also sa employees dito po sa site kami po yung nag-manage. And also, yan po, isa sa mga activities po namin is to uh, have recycling uh, activities para po malasin po yung uh, disposal po namin sa uh, basura. And also, we are and implementing po uh, landscaping activities for upcycling sa aning mga contractors. 
yan, some of the photos of the land, uh, recycling activities ng site and also the contractors. So na-mention ko na po ito kanina and also uh, I mentioned earlier po 100% po ng food waste po namin nakukonvert na into fertilizers. Okay? And uh, yung hazardous waste management po namin of course uh, the same for the solid waste management kami po yung nag-cater po or temporarily store dito yung mga basura hazardous waste po ng mga contractors. Kami po yung nadidispose accredited the treater and transporter. And this is, these are the photos of our Temporary service space facility. So I some of you here siguro po nakapunta na dito. And also we are capacitating all our community members, especially in uh, drafting policies related to solid waste management. These photos, ito po yung ginawa namin na capacity, capacity building po sa mga sa Emergado na Barangay Council. Ito yung po host community po namin. Okay? And of course, also we are uh, giving awards and recognitions to our contractors nag implement po ng environmental management system or nag-follow po sa environmental procedure po namin dito sa site. Ito po yung mga photos po ng mga awards na binigay namin sa mga contractors. Yan, for the air, air and noise quality monitoring management, of course, we are conducting uh, periodic uh, testing to the air quality management and also watering sa mga areas po na uh, may, ano po, may dust. So, isa po yung isa sa ginagawa natin dito sa site. Yan, the actual picture. And also, uh, for the coastal resource management, so uh, our implementation is that it's a ridge to reef of principle. And, and I mentioned earlier, it is an ISO-based implementation based po dito, and then proactive involvement of the management and the community-based approach also. And then, yan, uh, uh, we are doing a monitoring sa mga discharges po namin, especially dito sa Kalinawan River. Isa, ito po yung isang discharge namin dito sa site. And then, uh, coastal resource management, uh, uh, partner po natin dito yung mga Fisher Folks uh, Association dito po sa Limigian and Tinigmasan. Uh, Semi-annual, we're conducting uh, assessment po dito sa ating coastal area, especially doon sa ating established na sanctuary. So, may marine uh, scientists po nag-evaluate Kasi mayroon po tayong uh, near-locate na corals doon. Yan po itong picture po ng uh, coral, ano po, uh, clams, giant clams. And also we are giving uh, part po ng implementation, yung mga turnover po yung mga COVID uh, preparnalias doon po sa host and community, uh, neighboring communities po natin. For the conservation values, of course, uh, all of the activities or the sort of environmental celebration na in-implement or sinis-celebrate po ng DNR is also celebrating here in our site. Example, we have this International Day of Forest, the Earth Hour, the Earth Day. Earth Day po is a big celebration po here in our site. Uh, dito po uh, ginaganap yung uh, ginawa at binibining kalikasan. Yan po. And of course, uh, part of the, some of the activities also, we have the coastal cleanups, the Environment Day, the Arbor Day. And also last uh, June 2021, June 29 to 30, 29 to 30, 2021, we conducted an environmental symposium sa ano po dito po sa site. Participated of course with different uh, ano po, academics and also other uh, uh, viewers. And also for the last is the research and development. So the company has a lot of partner research with academe. So uh, one, one here is CSU, so marami po tayong ongoing na research partner po yung CSU ngayon. Uh, some of the photos, ito po yung uh, preliminary meeting with the Green Environment Defenders Consultancy for the Environmental Technical Audit of the company. And ito po yung photo po ng ongoing research with the LSU, CMU, IAT, yan po. And currently, meron pong uh, research na gina, uh, ginawa, ginagawa ngayon yung MSO IAT and LASAL. And for our trainings and our activities, so online po tayo ngayon nagpapatrain sa ating employees and contractors related to ISO and also other activities or trainings. And also, we capacitated all our MMT members related to ISO kasi nga po they're auditing our company quarterly. And also, MMT inspection, so... Uh, Lagi-lagi uh, po yan, uh, every semi-annual po ngayon kasi may pandemic yung MMT natin. Audits and also an 
this one is not recommended by the uh, EMB for the uh, uh, anti-illegal mining operations together with the MGP-13. Uh, for the uh, certificate for the environmental performance have been no negative findings for the three consecutive quarters of our MMT. And also, we are recognized by MB13 for the exemplary efforts in adopting a stero or water body program. So these are the, some of our trainings and also online trainings for our contractors and here, my PCOs. Uh, we are also attending uh, online trainings for them. And uh, frequent IEC po for our uh, implementation of our EPEP. So this ends my presentation. So for the for the, for many years of um, uh, operating here in uh, as a mining company, ito lang po yung uh, learnings po ng company. So building a good relationship with stakeholders of its own reward. So environmental protection is considered as our top management priority. Sharing of responsibilities across the organization brings operational efficiency, meeting in mind, sharing the best practices as one industry. So kaya nga po, uh, before COVID times, po, uh, we are really uh, encouraging other mining companies and even academics and other establishments to visit our company para po may ma-share man po kami kay papano na we can replicate ito our their operations or kung sila din po meron, meron silang best practices, we can share it to ours din po. And starting it right, keeping the end in, end in mind. So that's end my presentation. So thank you for listening. I hope you get something from my presentation. Thank you. Thank and once you. again, good afternoon. Yes, thank you, Mr. Tagro, for sharing to us the environmental management programs of your company. All right, we will have a five-minute break first before we proceed with the next discussions. You can have your bladder break or coffee, coffee or water break or maybe do some stretching. Also, you can use this time to have your questions formulated and have it placed in the chat box. We will see you in five minutes. Policies, Policies can, can either, either make or break, or break a, country a country and its, and its people. people. Hence, Hence, they should, they should be, thoroughly be thoroughly studied and evaluated. This is where policy research comes in. Through Malacanang Proclamation 247 in 2002, the government declared the month of September as Development Policy Research Month or DPRM. The DPRM aims to promote nationwide awareness on the importance of policy research in the formulation of evidence-based policies, plans, and programs. It also aims to cultivate a strong culture of research and research use among decision makers and raise the public's literacy on socio-economic issues. The proclamation also designated the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS to oversee and coordinate all activities related to the DPRM. Various activities such as policy forums, press conferences, social media promotion, and the annual public policy conference are organized by PIDS and its partners to celebrate the DPRM. Every year, the DPRM focuses on a particular theme which is usually a current or an emerging development issue of national significance. For instance, the DPRM has centered on issues pertaining to regulations, risk reduction and management, decentralization, the fourth industrial revolution, the new globalization, and the reforms needed to address the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. This 2021, to follow through on last year's theme on innovating governance for the new normal, the DPRM is focusing on the theme reset and rebuild for a better Philippines in the post-pandemic world. Through this theme, we wish to emphasize that to rebuild from the COVID-19 pandemic and create a better Philippines, we need to reset our paradigms and practices by balancing the interests of people, profit, and planet. This means placing equal importance on economic, social, and environmental well-being and sustainability. To make this possible, the government should set the right policies that will allow all citizens, regardless of status in life, to access essential public services and will protect all segments of the population, especially the poor and the vulnerable, from various risks through effective social protection systems. The business sector, for its part, should explore ways and areas where it can be both profitable and socially responsible. 
Business owners and operators should embrace decent work principles, provide the best service to their customers, and care for the well-being of their employees, the community, and the environment. Meanwhile, the civil society should continue reaching out to sectors that do not have access to government channels. It should also strengthen its advocacy for more accountable and responsive governance and more sustainable business practices. The academe also has an important role to play. It should ensure that the new modes of delivering education and training under the new normal are accessible to all and will not widen economic and social inequalities. As individual citizens, we also need to start living more responsibly by adopting more sustainable lifestyles. We should start the reset and rebuild agenda with ourselves to effectively influence others. Collectively, we all need to work together. The government, business sector, academe, civil society, and the general public should join forces in pursuing a shared vision of an equitable, sustainable, and resilient post-pandemic Philippines. Know more about the DPRM and how you can participate by visiting its website. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan mo na gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiya ang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ng kalagahan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! during the 1992 Civil Engineering Licensure Examination. He had his Master in Public Administration taken at Surigao del Sur State University in Pandag City. He took up his PhD degree in Management Program at St. Joseph Institute of Technology, Butuan City. Engineer Sanchez received both local and international scholarships and was a recipient of various awards. He's also the former Chief Education Program Specialist of Commission on Higher Education, Caraga Regional Office, and is currently the Campus Director of Philippine Science High School, Caraga Ampayon, Butuan City. Guests and participants, help me welcome our second panelist, Engineer Ramil A. Sanchez. A round of virtual applause, please. Engineer Ramirez, out oh, Sorry, I'm <laughs> mute. Thank yes, you, Ms. Okay, uh, okay Paul. Good afternoon, uh, Secretary Manny Pinyol, Dr. Anisito Urbita, my kababayan from Surigao del Sur, uh, Dr. Anthony Pinaso, 
the uh, speakers, Dr. Gonzalez, Dr. Sirunay, and uh, Kadodoy, my uh, fellow discussants, Ms. Giseline, represented by Mr. Lin Tagod, and uh, another discussant, my uh, former classmate at uh, Mindanao State University, Ms. Uh, Nanette. Friends, fellow public servants, madayaw na hapon sa ato tanan. So, inaot paunta na maayong ang panahon. This is a very uh, rare opportunity to be part of this uh, very important undertaking of the Mindanao Development Authority. I uh, thank the uh, organizers, especially my classmate, uh, Engineer Emilia Luanza, who uh, requested me to share. Uh, I said maybe whatever I can share as a uh, Mindanawan, I would. So having uh, worked in different branches of the government, I am very much eager to be part of bringing this uh, island of Mindanao to a higher level of uh, development. So uh, we are very glad to have us with us three uh, very informative, inspiring presentations. So uh, first, with the uh, presentation of uh, Dr. Gonzalez of the uh, Philippine Institute of Development Studies. We would like to uh, congratulate, uh, by the way, PIDs for uh, having done very good uh, uh, contribution to the development of uh, the country through research and uh, helping us uh, come up with uh, very relevant uh, policies for development. Mindanao is uh, called the land of promise. So uh, in the words of uh, the uh, founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, he says, and I quote, the pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and reset our world. Thus, for our beloved Mindanao, I go with the PIT's research team that we should have a great reset and rebuild towards a more inclusive, resilient, and sustainable economy for the Mindanaoans. Resetting and rebuilding better must lead to better outcomes. We should give the grassroots organizations and the ordinary Juan, Juana, their voices on the new blueprint for the post-pandemic better Mindanao. I support that we should mainstream and upgrade the Bayanihan spirit of the Filipino, not just among the Filipino corporations, but as well as to foreign investors. On the second talk of Dr. Sirunay, I'd like to uh, commend Caraga State University, our uh, partner of the Philippine Science High School, Caraga Region Campus, just across the street in the highway for their efforts in fostering the Tripole Helix collaboration in this part of the region. You see, our region is in a very challenging situation. But uh, I see that what they're doing can become a model for other parts of the country. The Tripole Helix collaboration among the academy, the industry, and the government is key to fostering economic and social development, making us more competitive in the knowledge-based economy. Especially, we are heading to the fourth industrial revolution. So the academy, which includes the universities, the colleges, the institutes, the secondary specialized education, the training 
centers which are uh, under uh, TESDA, the uh, University of Colleges under CHED. Uh, for us, uh, we are under the Department of Science and Technology, can provide support to the government and the industry, research and development efforts. Uh, we can provide expertise and we train the next generation of scientists, engineers, and researchers which we need, and the technicians and the craftsmen who are what we need in fostering development of our agriculture and manufacturing sector. I agree with the Caraga State University that we need a sustainable pathway for the whole mining sector to ensure greater positive outcomes to the community and the economy. There must be more value adding in the region where there is mining. We have seen that starting in Caraga region, but we look, we look for more. That may be in a certain region, but probably in the Mindanao Island. I see the strength of the instrument introduced by Dr. Serunai, and I propose that this should be adapted so the Strategic Environmental and Social Assessment, or CESA, can be a good tool to assess other mining and development projects in Mindanao. With this, we can have more inclusive development. Lastly, to Kadudoy Balyon, I have great appreciation. I saw the video of Secretary Mignol uh, I think that was last month. I highly appreciate what they've done. So, Kadodoy, congratulations. Uh, you are truly uh, uh, worthy Magsaysay awarding. Continue with your uh, great leadership and uh, your efforts with your uh, group to care for the Nature's Bank. So, I see uh, a new word, Nature's Bank. So, it's very interesting to uh, see you, uh, Kadudoy, on the video. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in person, probably with our scholars, so that we can share what you've done. So your organization, COMFAS, can be considered a gold standard for testing grassroots organizations' impact to the environment and society. Probably, I have not seen in the presentation, but I'm looking for uh, probably upgrading that uh, we can have more business enterprises within your organization, probably some vertical and horizontal integrations and funding from land bank and other funding institutions. As a former land banker who worked in the countryside, so we've always had this motto that the cooperative is not the best way to a farmer's prosperity, but it's the only way. And I have seen your organization have greater potential to uplifting the lives, uh, not just in the province of Sibukai, but inspiring other farmers and fisher folks in the whole in the whole island of Mindanao. I support Kadodoy's idea of having a barangay agriculturist fishery technologies. So this is very challenging to the LGOs. Probably we can take the approach of Tripole Helix. Uh, I know you have uh, a neighboring state universities and colleges like CSU, and uh, you have uh, graduates of agriculture and fisheries who can uh, volunteer, and probably some of our teachers who are doing research, some of those who like to uh, volunteer can probably have this uh, idea started. But we look forward to the increase of the uh, era of the LGO that uh, someday this can be realized. So we look forward to a vibrant, inclusive, resilient, adaptable, and leading edge Mindanao or viral. So Magiging viral ang Mindanao, vibrant, inclusive, resilient, adaptable, and leading its 
Mindanao. Thank you very much for this opportunity, Minda and the uh, organizing team. God uh, bless us all. Thank you so much, Engineer Sanchez, for your kind and encouraging words. Announcement, for those requesting for the presentations, Minda and PIDS will be posting in their website. They will also share a link to all participants. We are down to our last panelist. Okay, for this panelist, um, she came from, she's representing, sorry, she's representing the non-government or civil society organization. Let us all welcome Ms. Regina Nanette Salvador Antequisa. Ms. Regina Nanette Salvador Antequisa is a seasoned peace and development worker and advocate, particularly in Mindanao and especially in communities and areas where people living in poverty and marginalization reside. Her work experiences include sustainable management of natural resources, conflict transformation, disaster risk reduction, and climate action, social enterprise development, humanitarian work, community organizing and community development, networking, and policy advocacy. Ladies and gentlemen of this virtual forum, help me welcome our third panelist, Ms. Regina Nanette Salvador Antequisa. A virtual round of applause, please. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Robin Gallego, at magandang umaga po sa ating lahat, uh, especially to yeah, Secretary Manny Pinyol and uh, mga kasamahan sa Mindanao Development Authority, to President Dr. Anthony Penaso at uh, uh, kasamahan sa Caraga State University to Dr. Anisit Orbita and the PDIS team. And of course, ating mga uh, expert presenters, um, Kadodoy Balyon, uh, Dr. Romil Saronay, Dr. Margarita Gonzalez, and uh, sa aking kapwa panelist, uh, Ms. Agenggin, uh, represented by Mr. Tagod, and uh, Engineer Romil Sanchez, classmate uh, sa Mindanao State University. Uh, nice to see you here. Magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. Um, it's really, um, yeah, uh, I just would like to start. No, yung sinabi kanina ni Dr. Um, uh, a quote by, uh, quoted by Dr. Pinaso from Jim Ferrer. Not an expert, listen to the experts, but yes, the experts should be listening to the people. And uh, for surely we have experts from uh, the people on the ground. And that's what actually yung uh, naririnig natin sa storya. Uh, ng buhay at uh, sinalaysay ni Kadodoy no, na napaka-inspiring po. Uh, we wish uh, as um, what Dr. Margarita was uh, presenting um, a very uh, nice framework no, in um, the need to reset and uh, in order to rebuild effectively towards a better uh, Mindanao and society the post-COVID um, condition. So um, indeed, no, like um, if we really uh, would like to rebuild, uh, we wish to become more resilient. We wish to become uh, more equitable. We wish to become uh, more sustainable in our um, framework of development. And that's what actually uh, Dr. Margarita's uh, presentation uh, was uh, centering about, you know, like, um, uh, yes, uh, the mention of uh, the failing of the existing capitalist system, which I do really agree and that we have realized uh, very much during this COVID pandemic time. No? So, nakikita natin no, ang uh, mga kailangan talagang baguhin sa ating uh, sistema, sa ating mga framework, sa ating approaches, sa ating practices. And um, I really like, uh, in, and I'm inspired, no, sa uh, like uh, what PIDS, uh, like a framework has uh, uh, like uh, suggested or recommended for for the stakeholders no, in, in development processes at yeah, of course, it's not only the private sector, but also for the government, no, to look into 
And uh, to ensure that we have this equitable and sustainable development, we need to consider our environment and uh, our the, the social aspect of it as well as of the governance. For EcoWeb, uh, kung saan ako nang galing, uh, uh, the ecosystems work for essential benefits. We also like see you know, in the mean where we are operating dito sa Mindanao, and uh, while we are also operating in other parts of the country, but uh, mainly sa Mindanao, and we have actually like identified four major um uh for major uh elements or like challenges no in our um condition in Mindanao that actually like results to or contribute to the vulnerabilities vulnerabilities of communities and that's like one uh like poverty you know we have uh so while there are so much like efforts being done programs investments and uh uh, so we have actually so much uh, we've seen you know, investments, uh, not only from the private, but also from the government, but still poverty continues. And uh, while the poverty continues, we, we, we also have like uh, witnessed the destruction of the environment and even like the uh, observe and experience the impact of climate uh, change. Uh, and uh, in Mindanao, it's not only poverty and environmental problem but also we have an ongoing still no conflict in different parts of uh, uh, the island and um that actually contributed no to uh yung sinabi natin sa panahon ng pandemya uh, mas nakaka ano pa no, nakakasadlak no sa sa sitwasyon ng komunidad kung saan may covid na may natural disaster pa silang hinahanap at hinaharap at yung iba may conflict pa no so and they're even displaced and uh especially we know no in, in some still no in in bar, bar, uh, barm and even in the karaga uh, region we have seen actually like communities especially the indigenous peoples affected of conflict and uh this is also like uh we have uh uh, also done some uh, research, you know, in, in, in some Karaga uh, areas, indigenous peoples areas, even those affected of the, like also like in the mining area. So experiencing this and the fourth um, challenge uh, that we have also like uh, considered, you know, uh, like resulting to vulnerability of communities is governance. So uh, I really like, you know, like uh, how how the Kadodo passionately like uh, shared their, his views on that the important role no of the people not to be heard by our government because like without participation of people in in the governance system without the representation we know that um policies as he's saying policies could not be that um responsive actually you no know, to what the people are really saying or feeling to be needed to be done on the ground we have uh, seen no, like uh, like sa, sa gobyerno natin uh, well, i am also representing no, the victims of disaster and calamity sector in the national anti poverty commission uh for for um uh, us in the the, the 14 basic sectors uh, sa national anti poverty commission we are there uh to to represent in the uh, policy advocacy to to uh help in the poverty eradication no as a uh, based on the agenda set by the basic sectors and uh as like the sharing of kadudoy we actually i could actually share that in so many like discussion among the basic sectors no but what I, what i have actually like i'm so inspired no listening to him because uh, as a, if only policy makers if only decision makers in our government uh, from the national government to the local government would also be listening no, to these experts that we have uh, from the academe, uh, from, from the, the, the institutions, think tank institutions, as well as from the people experts on the ground, uh, uh, certainly and surely you know, we can have a better like a policies and better programs to address poverty uh, and to address like uh, the challenges that the people are facing, especially this uh, pandemic and hopefully post pandemic for echo web uh we actually like um uh also um uh, advocate no for a social enterprise a uh, social enterprise as an approach you no know, for addressing those four challenges in Mindanao as i've mentioned and for 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 uh, we define actually social enterprise with four peace you no know, like uh, so peace uh we say first p for the social enterprise is profit 
I really like what Dr. Margarita no, was saying, like, uh, so this uh, framework on, uh, like, big, between stakeholders, capitalism, and shareholders, capitalism. It's very clear on the importance of this reset, no, like, uh, how do we ensure that profit from businesses will not only benefit those, like, major, you know, like, uh, the capitalist systems that actually, like, make the rich richer and the poor poorer, but how can we ensure that the enterprises as Kadodoy was uh, uh, sharing would also benefit and the profit would also like be shared you know, with the people on the ground. Those who actually may be sacrificed with the extraction of the resources, for example. So we have actually heard you know, the research of the uh, the the uh, Caraga State University. I really like you no know, this the, the the result of the the research and also this framework of CESA and uh, their proposal on how to ensure that. Even mining, no? uh, how can we make mining possibly sustainable? We have uh, also listened no, to an example. But we know that, and we could also like hear a lot of story from the ground, that until and unless uh, policies and programs are not actually based on what the people are really like experiencing and recommending, uh, like we would always be, you no, know, like experiencing this, and uh, where profit of investments would only benefit more those like investors, the shareholders that uh, Dr. Margarita is saying. So, like as an NGO representative, uh, like it's just really my uh, like dream as well, you no, know, like with our social enterprise um, uh, advocacy, that profit could of, of the investments could also be shared with the people who really like um yeah should be like benefiting from the like uh, the, the 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 use of our resources especially and uh, in the context of Mindanao especially. And uh, so yeah, profit in the next P for us is like uh, yeah uh, people. Um, uh, Doc, uh, Kadodoy is uh, like um, already demonstrating their their story is already demonstrating how enterprises no should like uh, benefit the, the the people how should it empower so I like you no know, their their framework of like people empowerment as a like a core element in sustaining you know, their social enterprise because without an empowered people on the ground always like uh, yeah so development. Maybe there, like uh, we can see, like uh, our GDP increase, but not necessarily really. It may like it would address poverty, as what we are seeing in many communities where mining are present, and uh, in other like extractive industries. So we really hope that uh, the, the 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 frame of the research of the Caraga uh, uh, State University and the PIDS framework that uh, they are actually like offering and recommending, like policymakers and decision makers in our government, especially. And also the private sector would really reflect on this. And so we have actually like already um, like uh, yeah the models on the ground that we could learn from of uh, uh, like what Kandukadudoy was uh, saying how people empowerment should look like. How do we like factor that in into our planning no, and our programming and in our framework development? The third P for um, EcoWeb uh, called that um, so apart from from people is um, the planet. So um, uh, we we have heard in the in the in both pre three presentations on the importance of the environment in all our undertakings. So without sustainable uh, sustainable uh, environment, without protection of environment, without factoring that into like our development framework, certainly all development process will not sustain. So we have already like experienced the impact of climate change. And we know for a fact, everybody of us here, uh, yeah, there is already this, you know, like climate change actually is a human made, you no, know, uh, like a disaster. Like as a result of industrialization that we all know that benefit much those capi the capitalists you know, in in this in this system, but but uh, impacting much so much, you know, those actually at the, uh, that don't have actually direct you no know, a contribution in the making of it. So we we are uh, like uh, the environmental, the planet, and in 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 the social enterprise context, Concept we really need to ensure for us to have like sustainable source of livelihood for communities, for people on the ground. And uh, as it, uh, uh, in a way, we can say that we can have sustainable development in Mindanao, in the Philippines, and in the whole country. And for EQUIP, the fourth, there is fourth P, especially in Mindanao, there is this is very um, like uh, relevant. And for us, 
well, the well, we may have like um yeah uh, growth in our in our economy in a development, but without peace, this development would not really sustain. So for us, uh, in the development should be bringing peace and that should be creating more conflict. And what we have actually like witnessed, you know, a lot of communities, especially in mining communities, creating conflict on the ground, creating conflict among like members of communities of indigenous peoples' communities. Like uh, so, there is like uh, yeah, of course we have also seen, you no know, like other extractive industries like uh, creating conflict. So we, I, I, I really hope that we can also factor that in in the in our framework of development, if we really would like to um, like reset, reset and rebuild better our economy, our society. So like, uh, so it's not only like environment and I don't and uh, like poverty reduction, but also we have to ensure that it could bring peace to Mindanao. So thank you so much for this opportunity, and I am I'm, I'm really like uh, thankful for the opportunity to be able to hear to our experts here. Good afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Nanette Antekisa, for your valuable insight. Here with us right now in this virtual forum is Secretary Manny Pinyol, who will give us his closing speech later. Good afternoon, po, Secretary Pinyol. Welcome. Po. After all the informative and inspiring talk from our speakers and panelists, I'm sure you have the questions you would like to raise. So let's have an open forum. We have 30 minutes for the open forum. You can type in your questions in the chat box and I will read them for you. Just type in your name, affiliation, to whom your question is addressed, and then your question. Our participants in FB Live can also raise their questions through the comment, comment section. Okay, so we have here so far three questions. I will read the first question. This is from Ma'am Sheila Shar of PIDS. This question is for Ka Dodo. Congratulations, Mr. Balion, for the award that you received from the Ramon Magsaysay Foundation. And thank you for sharing with us the programs, projects, and development framework of your organization. Ano po ang naging epekto ng pandemia sa inyong samahan at mga miyembro nito at paano po ninyo hinarap ang mga pagsubok na iyon? Ang tanong po, ano po ang naging epekto ng pandemya sa inyong samahan at mga miyembro nito at paano po ninyo hinarap ang mga pagsubok na iyon? Kadodoy? Yeah, ah, uh, is po, uh, good afternoon to everyone uh, sa lahat ng ating mga samahan ngayon sa ating uh, uh, forum na ito at ako'y nagpapasalamat sa host nito at sa uh, ating uh, Minda na tayo'y naimbitahan dito at nakapag-share ng ating mga uh, uh, wala tayong pwede, uh, wala, wala na tayong pwede ipang mayabang kundi ma-share ma lang yung, ano, yung mga uh, ginagawa natin at uh, baka makatulong po sa, sa lahat. Yun lang po. At dun sa, 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 ano, sa tanong na paano nakatulong yung programa or paano kami na uh, sa pandemic naka-ahon or naka-survive Simply po, dahil yung, kung hindi pala namin, uh, even before without the, the protection of our environment, which is the mangroves, and uh, to stop our illegal fishing and to establish more uh, livelihood and enterprise in our organization, maybe uh, uh, during the pandemic, we are also uh, one of those uh, people who are suffering from uh, some, uh, there's a lockdown, there's a no business, no movement. But because of our product like shellfish and 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 marine products and aquaculture, so the the business is still going and and yon anak tolong sa amin ng no, product na during pandemic ay napaka mura na uh, at napaka lakas ng bintahan dahil nadoon na sa amin mangroves at hindi mahal yung binta namin at yon ang 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 pinagagawa ng mga tao sa lokal na wala masyadong pira so so parang hindi namin naramdaman yung ano yung pandemic or lockdown noon. Yung nakatulong talaga sa amin yung yung tinatag namin yung mga proyekto na sustainable environment at mga local livelihood enterprises na yung uh, ano yung mga indigenous materials at indigenous uh, resources na amin paligid ay yun ang na-develop namin at during pandemic isang talaga na Thank you very much po Kadodoy. 
Um, second question is still for Ka Dodoy. This is from um, Ma'am Adoracion Navarro of PIDS. Una po sa lahat, congratulations para sa well-deserved Ramon Magsaysay Award. My question Salamat. po, paano niyo po na-extend ang empowerment sa environmental conservation, social enterprise development, at capacity building sa next generation sa youth? Ano po ang mga programa related sa youth sa mga aspetong ito na pwedeng tularan ng ibang people's organization? Organisado yeah, din po ba ang youth sa lugar ninyo at paano sila na-organisa? Um, Yan yeah, po. Uh, sa lahat po sa tanong at uh, salamat din sa mga bumabati sa akin. Sa kritari ninyo paalaman na maganda na kung po si Secretary Manny Pin. Kung arip siya yung ordered but hindi masyadong natutukan na ang ating programang pang ahinsya ng gobyerno. Although sa barangay mayroon tayong tinatawag na iski. Pero limited lang doon sa mga kung anong programa ng gobyerno for the youth. So nakikita kasi namin sa aming programa na o pag, pag wala na kami kasi tumatanda na rin kami. So itong mga anak namin, ang, ang pag-asa namin mag-sustain mag, mag the, the progress and project that we have done in the, our locality. And also, uh, dapat maano ito may, may tagasunod. Kaya ang ginawa namin to organize them, namin sila, isa sa programa ay sinama namin yung mga anak namin doon sa kung ano yung mga ginagawa namin, especially during uh, out of... Uh, No, yung mga walang klase. At ang ngayon, ang pinakamagandang ginawa namin na umubra at naka-effective, yung sa savings, yung mga youths namin ay ino-into na bigyan ng piko nung sabi ng mga kung wala namang kabuluhan sa kanilang panggawi araw-araw. So, nang naitatag namin itong savings lab sa tulong ng isa rin partner namin na Rera Philippines, so, na-organize natin namin yung mga batas programang youths or itong savings club. So, ngayon, halos na mga youths at mga children namin kasama sa savings club at sa programa na yan na to protect and manage our resources and to being a resilient youths or become a sustainable fishermen or fisher community in terms of savings their future, savings money, savings environment for their future. Yan po ang ginawa namin. Okay po, marami salamat po sa inyong initiatives, Ka Dodoy. Our third question is from Ma'am Sheila Almasa of Minda. Thank you for all the inspiring and encouraging presentations shared today in this forum. For Dr. Gonzalez, with the pressing implementation of Mandana's ruling with the LGUs, what would be the best practical approaches, top three, you would recommend for them to be able to reset and rebuild within their means and scope? Oh. For Dr. Gonzalez. Okay, salamat. Uh, um, yung question na yan, madali na mahirap. Uh, so, napakalaking pagbabago niyan. Uh, itong uh, 2020, 2022 lang, um, ang laki ng, we, we will have a windfall, uh, so, to, so to speak, sa mga LGUs. Magkakaroon na sila ng maraming funding, about 0.8% of GDP, ganyan kalaki. Ang problema nito ay, hindi naman problema, ang challenge is sana paano ba natin magagamit itong uh, biglang paglaking pondo na ito. Um, so, maraming capacity building na kailangang gawin. Um, meron ng mga programa dyan, uh, may mga funds na sinet up, merong tinatawag na growth equity fund na itinayo para tulungan yung mga LGUs na ma-build up ang kapasidad nila makapag-implement ng infrastructure projects especially. So, kailangan, kailangan natin yung infrastructure projects. Alam, uh, alam natin yan na kailangan natin. Ngunit hindi kasi ganun ka, ka, kadali na ano siya, um, to implement it. 
So, kadalasan, kahit may pondo dyan, hindi masyadong nagagalaw dahil kulang sa kapasidad na mag-manage ng, ng mga infrastructure. Okay, thank you po, Dr. Gonzalez, for your um, answer to that question. Um, perhaps our participants here in WebEx have questions. You can um, you can raise your hand and unmute your microphone so you can state your questions and address it to your to the speaker to whom your question is um, related. Anyone from the participants here in WebEx? You can um, turn on your microphones. Anyone who has questions? Okay. I see. Ms. Revolt, Ms. Uh, Roveling, kung walang question, I just would like to, ano, noong, uh, on the Mandana's ruling, uh, konti, no? like, uh, based on the reflection uh, of this, uh, I just would like to, to ano, share and inform no, that, uh, yes, we have just signed no, the uh, Magna Carta of the Poor. Uh, uh, virtually, just virtually, we're still waiting no, for the signature of the president for that. Uh, this actually would um, result no, to the crafting of the National Poverty Reduction Plan. Uh, to start from the local. So there would be like local poverty reduction planning. And we really hope that um, yeah, by starting next year with this process, that would be like promoting a bottom-up approach in planning. Those like uh, stories like what Tadudoy, uh, one was uh, like sharing and also challenging. Yung sinabi niya na um, uh, yung, yung sana yung uh, pondo no, ng gobyerno would help scale up those actually like uh, yung mga experience success nila yung yung uh, uh, approaches nila nakita ng actually successful that can ju that just need no, more support this kind actually of, of uh, like solution to the problems on the ground so this is actually the the real ano the, the, the yung nagpapakita na talagang kakayani no ma-address the people on the ground uh, even those in poverty can be part of the solution and with the local poverty reduction planning that is participatory that we hope you know, that all local governments would really like uh, support this and that uh, we could come up with a participatory process of local poverty reduction planning and that could help reset and rebuild you know, this post-pandemic pandemic condition. And we in, with uh, the increase of uh, the allot allotment for the LGU starting next year with the Mandanas and Garcia ruling, we know that uh, LG will have more resources and more capacity. And with the whole of society approach, people, the government, the private sector, and the civil society, and with the whole of government approach, we hope that we can do it better this time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Okay, maybe um, the presenters have something to say with regards to their reactions from our panelists. Presenters, do you have... Um, anything to say to our panelists regarding their reactions? May I? Yes, ma. Yes. May I? Adodoy. Yes, po. Uh, uh, so, sundan ko lang sinabi, napakagandang sinabi ni, ni ma'am yung, yung napresent ko na uh, in, in terms of yung mga, uh, if the government has the capacity to support or an uh, program uh, Ma, ma ano ma, ma implement talaga na ano yung magagandang mga programa na wag ka nang na, na hindi na masyadong nagre-research or hindi na masyadong uh, kung ano-ano pang mga mga uh, pag-aaral so tama yon na uh, yung mga gumagana at tested proven na mga programa uh, tulad sa food security yung mga programa pang environment yung pang pang, pang economic so dapat yan ang unang tinitingnan muna ng gobyerno at and i like the the, the initiative uh, hindi ko uh, ano pinataangat yung ating secretary opinion. Yun ang gusto naming makita on the ground na nakikita lang itong mga ganito. Kung may mga tulad ni ano, ginagawa ng mga tauhan na at mismo ng ating secretary ng Minda na binababaan talaga yung ano hindi lang nagbumabasa doon sa sa mga papel o hindi lang nakikinig sa mga kung ano. Pinababaan talaga. Nakikita nila ano yung totoo sa baba at, at uh, mismo kahit hindi na sinasabi ng tao alam nila na may may ganong pangangailangan at may ganong dapat gawin ang gobyerno doon. Yun ang maganda doon at gusto namin yung ipos ng, ng ating mga mambabatas. Salamat po. 
Maraming salamat, Kal Dodoy. Thank you. Um, other presenters? Um, can I just complete yung just... Uh, sagot ko kanina? Uh, because, ah, uh, sorry. Okay po, okay po, <laughs> Dr. Morgan. When you were asking ko ano yung, ano yung uh, pwedeng uh, gawin regarding Mandanas. So, just okay. for the, the, okay. ano, the, the one who asked the question. Uh, uh, so I think important is really to uh, to try to take advantage of the reform that's going on, take advantage of the funding for the capacity building, um, take advantage of the fact that you're going to have a lot of uh, inflow uh, uh, funding. And when you do decide, this is actually the point I wanted to make, when you do decide uh, to launch infrastructure projects, keep in mind what was presented today about uh, sustainability and uh, equality and uh, setting up infrastructure projects that are environment friendly and that help uh, LGUs uh, uh, to uh, withstand a disaster and survive uh, pandemics. So that's what I wanted to say. Salamat for Dr. Margarita, sorry. Yes. That's I okay, uh, because the, the Anna is very, I know, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Dr. Margarita. Um, anyone who still has something to say with regards to our discussion? Okay, mukhang wala na. So if that's the case, thank you very much, presenters and panelists, for the very informative and rich discussion that we had. We just had this afternoon. Now it's time for the photo op. So maybe you can turn on your camera so we can see you clearly. How beautiful and handsome our participants are this afternoon. And I would like to request Mr. Junji Church for the photo op. Thank you. Okay, um, requesting everyone who can turn on their cameras to please do so. So we will have our photo up. All right, smile. Give us your brightest smile. Okay. Sir Jun Lee will tell us when he is done. For now, just smile. <laughs> okay, one more. Okay, thank you very much. Now to formally close this event, we have with us a seasoned print and broadcast journalist, a farmer, and a politician. He is the seventh Mindanao Development Authority Chairman after being appointed by President Rodrigo Duterte in August 2019. Before his appointment, Secretary Pinol served as the Secretary of Agriculture under the same administration. He served as a writer for President Fidel Ramos in 1992. He joined public office after being elected as mayor of Emlang. North Cotabato Province in 1995. In 1998, he was elected as governor of the province and in 2010 as vice governor of the same province. He is also known for his advocacies to advance agriculture. As governor of Cotabato, he implemented bottom-up agricultural planning for priority crops such as rubber, oil, palm, banana, and coconut which program dramatically transformed the province from being one of the poorest provinces in 1998 to the top 30 provinces with the lowest poverty incidence in 2007. As the Minda chairman, he prioritizes poverty reduction, peace, and agricultural productivity. Ladies and gentlemen, let me call in Secretary Emmanuel F. Pinon, sir. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, glad to uh, join you in today's event uh, and uh, be your uh, closing keynote speaker. 
My dear friends, uh, nakikinig ka ko sa mga discussions and uh, all of those discussions actually point to one direction. Food for this country, the insurance of the availability of food for this country. In the Philippines right now, however, we have a problem. Agriculture has been relegated to being just one of the economic activities of this country. But let me bring you back in time to that period when the human being, the homo sapien, was just a simple animal working for his survival. Balikan natin yun. Ano bang nangyari sa history? Well, if we go back in time, maaalala natin na ang pinakaunang human activity actually was not business. It was not even trading. It was actually gathering of food for survival and existence. Ayaw kung makikita ninyo, ang unang, ang unang mga homo sapiens ay eh, na-discover nila yung mga gamit tulad ng mga stone, uh, tools, and everything in their effort to produce food for their clan, for their tribe, and for their community. So yun yung basic. Una, first activity was just hunting for food. They hunted for food because animals were so, were so plenty. No? Then they realized that if we can domesticate these animals, we will have more of them. We will have uh, a more stable supply of, of meat for the clan, for the tribe, and for the community. So they started domesticating animals. And then they found out that uh, the plants around them provided what their bodies needed to be able to survive. And so they planted, started harvesting uh, whatever it was that grew uh, around them. And when this was not enough to supply the needs of the clan or the tribe, they started growing them. That is basic agriculture. Wala tayong narinig noon na uh, ang una nilang inisip eh, paano ko kaya ibibenta tong baka na ito? O paano ko kaya ibibenta tong, uh, tong uh, deer na ito? O paano ko kaya ibibenta tong isda na ito? Ang unang nasa isip nila, basic human instinct, is how do I catch this animal to feed myself and my family? That is the basic function of agriculture which we are missing today. Today it has become just one of the economic activities of the country. In fact, kawawa sapagkat yung ganitong mindset is creating a lot of problems for our agricultural producers. Now, let me go back to the second point. No, I was just, as I was listening to you, I was just actually uh, writing these notes down. Ang basic role ng isang human family is to ensure sufficient supply of food for the family. Even as recent as 50, 60 years ago, I still remember my grandfather. I, I, I belong to a farming family. And when I was young, I saw my grandfather keep a portion of his harvest in a tabungos, a bamboo, uh, big bamboo uh, basket. Nakatago yun sa likod ng bahay. And that will never be touched until the next harvest season. So, when life was simple, the Filipino family only wanted to ensure that there would be enough food for every me member of the family to survive. The idea of growing food or domesticating animals for profit was unknown for ages. Wala yun, hindi yun ang, hindi yun ang motivation ng agriculture in the past. Tanim tayo, huli tayo ng, ano, ng uh, mga animals para makakain tayo. Hindi para kumita tayo. Kasi yung idea nung, nung profit, nung trading and profit was alien to the people of the olden ages. But when they realized that maybe there were some things that they could not sufficiently produce in their communities, 
they started looking out to other communities which may have an excess production of what they need or what they needed. And this was when barter trading between tribes started. But it was mainly aimed, not at profit, it was mainly aimed at ensuring sufficient food for the community, for the family, but never for profit. However, as the human population grew, the idea of producing food to supply the needs of other communities came to the awareness of the business-minded. Dito na nag-umpisa yung negosyo. Uy, mukhang maganda to ah. Uh, if we can grow so much uh, rice, uh, yung kabilang bayan baka kailangan nila, kikita tayo. So, dagdagan natin. No? And that started the idea of agriculture for profit. Now, this is already a transition from that very raw and basic function of agriculture, which is to feed the Filipino family, to feed the Filipino community, into a commodity that would contribute to the economic performance of the country started. This started the era of food becoming a commodity for profit and economic growth rather than just being the lifeblood of the nation. It was also at this point when the problems besetting Philippine agriculture today started. Today, like a work animal, parang kalabaw, Philippine agriculture is being whipped and flogged to force it to contribute to the country's economic performance. And its performance is computed on a quarterly basis. As if agriculture harvests quarterly, as if fish would be abundant quarterly, as if there would be no rains, there would be no typhoons, and other factors that could affect productivity. Pero ganun ang nangyari. Agriculture now is seen not just as a, a basic function of the community, ginamit na itong economic activity para makakontribute dun sa economic growth. Yung, yung absurd... <laughs> Yung invisible uh, uh, numbers that the economists always talk about. GDP, inflation, economic growth. Forgetting that hindi naman yun ang role ng agriculture sa buhay natin. Ang role ng agriculture sa buhay natin, siguro ay na may pagkain tayo. So parang kalabaw. Pinapalo, pinipwersa yung magtrabaho. And when it was actually not contributing to the level that the economic managers wanted it to perform, it was unjustly and unfairly punished. So now we see policies, legislations, that penalizes agriculture for its failure to live up to the expectations of the economic managers as an instrument in the country's economic growth. What do we have now? The rice tarification law, for example, it actually is a, an idea that was presented by the economic managers, which I uh, honestly personally resisted and fought off, but failed. Ito yung idea nila. Hindi kaya ng Pilipino mag-produce ng pagkain, ng bigas. Import tayo. But right now, Instead of uh, helping the Filipino farmers actually, we are actually killing them. From a high of 20 pesos per kilo, ang farm gate, about two years ago, it's now at, uh, as low as 10 to 12 pesos, and the farmers are crying. Ang problema niyan, the moment this continues, it will dampen the enthusiasm of our food producers to produce food for this country simply because it does not reward their efforts and their labor. And what is happening right now, agriculture's performance is measured on a quarterly basis. And any period when its contributions were not up, 
to the expectations of the economic managers, quick fix policies were introduced like massive importation of rice and the sector was punished. with less budgetary allocations. Look at the Philippine budget every year. For example, for 2022, the uh, estimated national budget is about 5.4 trillion pesos. And what is the amount allocated for Philippine agriculture? Less than 100 billion pesos. What is that? I'm not of, of hand, I, I cannot give you the percentage of 100 billion to 5.4 trillion. Kayo mas bagaling kayo sa math, pag i-compute lang. Pero ganyan, kaliit yung ibinigay ng budget for an activity that is supposed to be the assurance of national survival, for national survival. So, as it is right now, the economic managers are unyielding in their position that whatever the Filipino farmers could not sufficiently produce should be sourced abroad, come what may. Ang kanilang battle cry, it's a no-brainer. 105 million consumers against 5 million farmers. Consumerism has become the rule that controlled Philippine agriculture and made life difficult for the Filipino food producers. But here is the twist. It's a most unfortunate twist. It takes a pandemic, COVID-19, for our economic planners to now realize that the idea of depending on the world market for whatever food and commodity supply the country needs or lacks is actually a very dangerous proposition. At the start of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, Vietnam announced that it would be holding on to its rice stocks for a period of time. And question, now, kapag nangyari ito, Halimbawa, another pandemic or a uh, war at the uh, West Philippine Sea preventing the uh, travel of uh, vessels bringing rice from Vietnam and Thailand to the Philippines. Halimbawa, nangyari yan. What would happen to our country? Halimbawa, nagkaroon ng... I, may, I, hope, I hope it will not happen. Halimbawa, nagkaroon ng world famine. Climate change is unpredictable. Halimbawa, nag-fail ang crops ng lahat ng bansa. Do you think the idea of international food trading will still be respected and observed by those who signed to, that, to those agreements? No. The first thing that every leader of every country will do is to make sure that there is enough food for its people, damn the other countries. And this is the danger that we are treading into right now. And unless we correct this with the needed legislations, policy shifts, and a different perspective on the role of agriculture, on the lifeblood of this nation, then we will be facing an imminent danger in the future. Every country will always ensure that its people will have food. Huwag natin sabihin na kaawaan tayo ng Vietnam kapag wala tayong bigas. Kung kailangan nila ng bigas. Huwag natin sabihin na kaawaan tayo ng Brazil o ng Europe at padalan tayo ng baboy kung wala na tayong mga baboy dahil babait silang tao. No. Human nature dictates the idea of self-preservation. There is no such thing as international kindness or benevolence in times of a food shortage. 
And so, my dear friends, as we bring to a close this very important event that you're holding today, let me just emphasize once again, all of these things that I'm sharing with you brings us back to the basic principle of agriculture in the existence, survival, and growth of a nation. I will tell you one story of a country which depended on importation because they had a lot of money. Venezuela. Venezuela is known as one of the richest oil countries in South America, even the world. At the height of its oil power, Venezuela, Venezuelans actually lived in luxury. Everybody was enjoying the good life. They were importing almost everything. They abandoned their agriculture. It was expensive. Uh, mahal lang magtanim, uh, marami naman tayong pera, mar mar marami tayong revenue sa oil. And so they abandoned their agriculture. And then suddenly, their oil industry collapsed. And you, as you all know by now, as even as I speak, tens of thousands of Venezuelans actually are leaving their country to the neighboring countries to find food. And that is a blunder that we must not and never commit. My dear friends, let me end by saying this. Any nation blessed by God with resources to produce food, but which could not assure its people of sufficient food supply is a failed state. And I don't want to see the Philippines becoming a failed state. Let us reform our Philippine agriculture right now. Let us band together so that we will change the perspective of our economic managers and make them realize that agriculture is not an economic activity. Agriculture is a primary human activity needed for the survival of our communities, our provinces, and our country, and our people. Thank you very much, and good afternoon. Wow, thank you very much, Secretary Pinyol. Such an informative and inspiring talk to close today's forum. Thank you. Thank you again to all the participants, to the BARM government, government agencies, participants from the academy, from the different parts of the country, and from the non-government and civil society organizations and international partners. We really appreciate your presence with us this afternoon. A reminder, the post-event survey link is in the chat box for you to fill in. This has been indeed a fun and informative virtual forum. We hope to see you all again in all our future endeavors. You can access updates from the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and Mindanao Development Authority via their official websites and FB pages. Our gratitude as well to our speakers and panelists, guests, thank you very much. We appreciate you all for spending time with us this afternoon. See you all in the next Mindanao Policy Research Forum on September 2022. To the organizers, PIDS, Minda, and Caraga State University, thank you very much and congratulations. Perhaps you have announcements to make or any promotions? Okay, if not, thank you. And this has been Rosalind Gallego. Good afternoon and have a nice weekend. God bless everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you so much, sir. Salamat po. Uh, you, team. Minda. Thank you po. Secretary Pinyol, thank you. Sir Penaso, thank, thank you. you.